My name is Killian Forrester, and this happened to me in July of 2012. It's one of those stories that if you told someone outside of this area, they'd tell you that you were lying. But it happened. I wouldn't lie about something like this. I was working as a fire lookout in the Umpqua National Forest of Central Oregon at the time. It's pretty isolated work, not everyone is cut out for it. You have to like the solitude, the monotony, the quiet. Some folks find that unbearable after some time, especially if nothing is happening. Luckily for me, I've always leaned into that stuff. I was up in my tower, minding my own business as the sun started dipping down towards the horizon, when something caught my eye. Just outside the tree line, I saw it. Motion, a large shape in the shadows. At first, all I saw was its back. The thing had to be over seven feet tall, hunched over, matted hair, and covered in thick, dark fur. Muscle definition ripped with every movement as it slowly turned. And that's when I saw it. The head was, not right. The proportions were canine but massive, stretched like something pulled it long ways and thin. Its mouth hung open, and I could see rows of jagged, blood-stained teeth. Now, I'm no greenhorn. I was raised in the area, spent my life in the woods. I know what a bear looks like, what a cougar looks like. This, this was something else entirely. Before I could get a good sense of the thing, it vanished back into the trees. Shaking off the shock, I did what anyone else in this situation would do. I grabbed my rifle and went to investigate. I figured a wounded animal or something. What I found wasn't what I expected. There at the tree line was a carcass. I'm hesitant to call it a deer. It still looked vaguely deer-shaped, but the thing was mangled. Ripped apart. Blood soaked into the ground all around. The smell of old copper and rot filled my nose. I wanted to throw up. But as horrifying as the mess was, the strangest thing was the near-perfect circular chunk taken out of its neck. I heard a crunch of leaves and branches behind me. My blood went cold, and I whirled around, rifle raised on instinct. It was gone. Whatever it was, the monster that did this, it was gone. It vanished silently and left no trace, except this, abomination of a carcass. I took a few pictures and radioed down to the ranger station. I needed someone else to see this. My head was racing with everything this could mean. Some new predator? Something no one knew about? About half an hour later, two other rangers, Will and Sarah, came hauling gear up the hill. It was good to see them, to not be alone with this. They took one look at the carcass and froze in place. I'd seen the wide-eyed fear before on hunters who'd found something in the woods they couldn't explain. What in God's name? Will muttered, snapping a picture on his phone. Sarah just stared, her face pale. I ain't ever seen nothing like it, she said in a thick southern drawl. I told them what little I'd seen and how the thing seemed to disappear when I turned my back. They looked at each other. Shared that look. Will sighed heavily. Killian, I know you said you're not the type to make stuff up, Will started, choosing his words carefully, but maybe your eyes were playing tricks on you in the low light. Or maybe you cracked a beer too early. Sarah put in unhelpfully. My face must have given away my irritation because Will held up his hands in a placating gesture. Look, we'll take the pictures, write up a report, but it probably ain't nothing new. 
predator got lucky or something. Ain't no need to go panicking everybody. Something about their response didn't sit right with me. They weren't taking me seriously. That annoyed me. It wasn't like them, either. I knew them both. These weren't the type for wild theories, but it was like they already made up their minds. I spent the next few days on edge. Every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves had me ready to fire. I didn't see the creature again, but I wasn't sleeping right. I was constantly on watch, rifle in hand. One morning, I went out to get firewood from my supply shed. It was just a few yards from my tower, nothing that usually worried me. Except when I got there, the shed door hung open on busted hinges. Splinters of wood littered the ground. I hesitated, my gut screaming at me to turn and run, but I didn't. I crept closer, rifle held up tight against my shoulder. There were deep gouge marks in the shed walls, like something massive had clawed its way in. There were splatters of blood, too. Dark, thick blood, not from any animal I knew. And that same smell, that old copper, hung in the air. A sudden crunching sound from the woods behind me had me spinning around as my heart leaped into my throat. There, barely visible in the morning mist and dappled shadows, was the shape. The beast was watching me. Its yellow eyes shone like two dirty coins. It stood as still as a statue, as if daring me to make the first move. I raised my rifle. My one chance. My hands shook as I lined up the shot. And it moved. The thing was impossibly fast, disappearing into the brush in a blur. The blast from my rifle rang out, but there was no sign I had hit it. I cursed, pumping another round into the chamber. I waited, breathless, sweat pouring down my brow. But... Nothing came. The monster was just gone. I was alone again. I ran back to my tower, locking myself inside. There I sat, rifle cocked, staring out into the indifferent forest. Later that day, a patrol came to investigate my disturbance. I told them everything. I showed them the shed, the gouge marks and I made damn sure they smelled the blood. Soaked into the floor. They seemed disturbed, but gave me that same look I'd gotten before, dismissal with a sigh of pity. They wrote up a report, probably citing a bear or something, and drove off. I knew they didn't believe me. I was becoming the crazy lookout guy. So, I took matters into my own hands. I rigged the area with motion sensor cameras and audio recorders. I started logging every strange noise, every odd movement. Weeks turned into months, and still, I caught nothing. My obsession fueled me, but it also ate away at me. I started to unravel. Every time a branch snapped in the night, I was on my feet, gun in hand. I was seeing things out of the corner of my eye, the hulking shape or the flash of yellow just beyond my sight. Paranoia gnawed at my brain. The rangers became worried. It's hard to hide that level of crazy, and they noticed. They suggested time off, told me to get some rest. I refused. If I was gone, when that thing came back, there'd be no one to stop it. Then, one winter day, I hit a breakthrough. Checking one of the motion sensor cameras, there it was. Not the beast, no, something else. A hiker. A lost hiker way off the established trails. His gear was all wrong, tattered, and he was walking with a hunched, shuffling gait. 
he looked almost feral. When he got to a particularly dense patch of trees, he just disappeared from the camera footage. That's when it clicked for me. Maybe the beast wasn't some supernatural creature. Maybe it was just a man, a man who'd been living out in those woods for far too long. It explained the disappearances, the way it could vanish into thin air. This guy, whoever he was, he knew the forest better than anyone. I realized the rangers hadn't been disbelieving me. Instead, they were protecting me, or him. Armed with this new theory, I descended from my tower and ventured into those deep woods. I spent days tracking, picking up faint traces of this lost man. The deeper I went, the more unsettled I became. It was unnatural, the silence of this place. There were no birds, no scampering squirrels, just a thick, oppressive hush. And then I found it, his camp. It wasn't what I expected. No tent, no lean-to. Just a pile of moss, crude snares, and remnants of small animal kills, picked clean. There was a collection of bleached bones too, arranged in a rough circle that sent shivers down my spine. The guy was clearly unhinged, living a twisted, primal existence back here. Suddenly, I was sure he was watching me. I could feel that same prickling sensation I'd gotten when the beast was near. Then, I heard it, not a growl, not a roar, a ragged imitation of a human scream. It tore through the woods, chilling me to the bone. I needed to get out, get help. I turned to run, but a blur of movement caught my eye. He was there, crouched in the brush, a tangle of filthy hair and emaciated limbs. The eyes that looked back at me weren't animalistic anymore. They burned with a mad sort of cunning. He lunged. Time seemed to slow. I remember the glint of a bone knife in his hand, the fetid stench of his breath. I got off a shot, more out of desperation than anything. He jerked back, clutching his shoulder, and a howl of rage tore from him. And that's when they came. Not just one, but more. I couldn't count them all through the trees, but I glimpsed those ragged forms and their glowing eyes. I fired into the crowd, hoping to scatter them, to buy myself time. But for each one I dropped, two more seemed to rise from the shadows. I ran. The forest echoed with their unearthly screeches. A sharp pain burst through my calf and I went down my rifle flying from my fingers. I scrambled and clawed, trying to get back up. All around me, they were closing in. I remember the snapping of bones, the ripping of flesh, and then darkness. Maybe it was lucky I blacked out. When I came to, they were gone. My mangled, bleeding body was all that remained. A search party found what was left of me days later. There was enough to make identification, luckily. As for the camp and those, others, they vanished. The official report said animal attack, and to preserve the peace, no one said otherwise. Most believe it. Some don't, but those folks usually wind up missing too. This forest... It holds secrets, dark secrets. Some things just ain't meant to be understood. They say I was the last lookout posted to that tower. They say it's too dangerous now. And after what I saw, after what happened to me, maybe that's for the best. My name's Grant Miller. And this happened to me back in 2010, during my rookie season as a fire lookout in the remote wilderness of Oregon. 
always loved the outdoors, figured it'd be better than getting stuck behind a desk. Little did I know the kind of outdoors I was signing up for. First few weeks were pure paradise. Tower perched above miles of old-growth forest, a sea of green under an endless blue sky. Nights were another world, the Milky Way splashed across the inky expanse. Figured this was as cushy as wilderness jobs got. Should have known better. It started with the dreams. Vivid, unsettling things, all darkness and twisted trees. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the sound of rasping breaths echoing in my ears. Figured it was stress, the isolation playing tricks on me. Then the birds went silent. One morning, the usual chorus of chirps and squawks was just gone. The forest fell into an eerie hush. Even the insects seemed to quiet down. Sent a shiver down my spine. Tried to radio it in, but the signal was patchy. They brushed it off, said it was probably just the weather or me getting spooked. They didn't know the half of it. By nightfall, the unease had settled into bone-deep dread. The silence itself seemed to press down on the tower, suffocating. Then, I heard it, scratching at the base of the tower, faint at first, then growing louder. Something was down there, circling. Heart pounding, I crept to the window. It was too dark to see properly, but I caught a flicker of movement in the moonlight. A gaunt, hunched shape, taller than any man ought to be. Its eyes glowed a chilling yellow, a predator sizing me up. I fumbled for the rifle, hands shaking violently. I'd always been a decent shot, but this, this felt different. My finger tightened around the trigger, and I hesitated. There was something about the creature that stopped me, a gnawing feeling that this wasn't just some lost bear or mountain lion. It possessed a chilling intelligence that turned my blood to ice. It reared back on its hind legs, claws scrabbling at the glass. In the moonlight, the details were horrifyingly clear, hairless, leathery skin pulled taut over a skeletal frame, a fanged maw that opened in a silent snarl. It was a nightmare given form. I fired a warning shot into the air, the blast echoing through the night. The creature hissed in rage and dropped down. The scratching stopped, replaced by a heavy thud as it stalked off. Didn't sleep at all that night, just waited for the dawn, knowing the reprieve was temporary. When the sun finally rose, I ventured outside with shaking legs. There were tracks in the dirt below, enormous clawed footprints that sent shivers down my spine. I followed the trail into the woods curiosity warring with terror. It led me to the carcass, a young buck, not half-eaten, but torn open with monstrous strength. That's when the realization hit me. This thing wasn't scavenging. It was hunting, toying with its prey, and I was next on the menu. Radio was still spotty. Managed to get through to the supervisor long enough to blurt out what was happening before the signal cut out again. A tense silence followed, then his voice, hesitant and tight with fear. He told me to barricade myself in and wait. A ranger patrol would be sent out, but it would take hours to reach my location. Hours I didn't think I had. The afternoon dragged by in a fog of terror. Every rustle of leaves made me jump. Just after sunset, the scratching started again. Persistent. Relentless. I peered out the window. Two pairs of glowing eyes stared back this time. They had brought reinforcements. The night was filled with a symphony of horror, the scratching at the door, 
the low growls, the maddening sound of their deliberate movement just below the floorboards. I huddled in a corner, rifle clutched to my chest, waiting for the inevitable assault. Then, over the creature's snarls, I heard a new sound, a rumbling that steadily grew louder. Engine noise. I staggered to the window, a surge of desperate hope rising within me. Headlights pierced the darkness below, casting long, dancing shadows on the trees. A rescue team had arrived. The creatures hissed and retreated into the trees, their eyes gleaming with hatred as they vanished from sight. Weak need with relief, I watched as the rangers cautiously approached the tower. They'd heard the tail end of my panicked radio call and mobilized a response team with surprising speed. When they cautiously made it up to my tower and found me, I was a babbling mess. I doubt they believed half of what I told them. Official report said bear attack, despite the unusual details I could recall clear as day. They bundled me off the mountain with forced gentleness, a flurry of medical checks and concerned questions I couldn't fully answer. It all felt unreal, like stepping from a nightmare into the glaring light of a sterile hospital room. The look in their eyes told me the story, they thought I'd cracked under the strain of isolation. Maybe they were right. Tried to return to normal life, find a new job, something with solid walls and a lot of people around didn't work. Every dark corner held lurking shadows, the flicker of car headlights at night sent my heart pounding with the memory of glowing eyes. The dreams never left, filled with rasping breaths and that terrible, clawed hand reaching, reaching. It was about a year later when the news reports started cropping up. Missing hikers in the Oregon backcountry, disappearances the authorities couldn't explain. One article showed a photo from a park camera, grainy and indistinct, yet chillingly familiar in its distorted outline, a gaunt figure hunched at the edge of the frame. They blamed animal attacks, cougars gone rogue, said folks shouldn't wander off trail alone. But I knew better. And I knew they weren't done. Those things in the woods, they were patient, relentless. They hunted me once, tasted my fear. The question wasn't if they would return, but when. Word reached me a few weeks later, whispered through backcountry channels that didn't make the news. Another lookout disappeared from a nearby tower, no sign of a struggle, no trace ever found. Just a chilling silence that echoed my own experience all too well. That's when I made my decision. They labeled me unstable, unfit for duty after that night. Maybe they weren't wrong, but they also didn't see what I saw, didn't know the true horror that lurked in those ancient forests. It was time to stop hiding, stop waiting to be the next victim. It was time to go back into the wilderness. I spent months preparing, gathering supplies, studying tracking techniques. It felt insane even to me, heading back into the nightmare. But a hunted animal can cower in fear, or it can turn and fight with the cunning of the predator. The towers were traps, isolated beacons that drew the creatures in. Out in the vast expanse of the woods, maybe I stood a chance. The plan was simple and desperate, find them before they found me. Track the trackers, become the hunter before the hunted. There were risks, a thousand ways everything could go wrong. Every flicker of movement in the undergrowth made me flinch. I jumped at my own shadow and slept, when I slept at all with one eye open. Days bled into weeks, and my determination began to crumble. The oppressive silence of the forest, the knowledge of what stalked the shadows, it was slowly eating away at my sanity. 
I'd almost turned back, ready to accept the label of crazy old lookout, when I stumbled upon their tracks. Not the sloppy imprints of a bear, but those monstrous clawed footprints that haunted my nightmares. Dread battled with a twisted surge of exhilaration. I'd found them. I followed the trail, moving with the practiced stealth of a desperate man. The hunt lasted for an eternity. The tracks led me deeper into the remote wilderness, towards a tangle of ravines and caves. Finally, I saw the first flicker of those hateful yellow eyes, not from one creature, but a whole pack. There were five of them, lean and skeletal, slinking through the undergrowth with a chilling sense of purpose. My breath hitched in my throat, but something had shifted inside me. I wasn't just some cowering prey anymore. I had the element of surprise, the righteous fury of the wronged. Carefully, I took aim. The gunshot pierced the air, and a creature shrieked, tumbling down in a tangle of limbs. The others scattered in a flurry of enraged hisses. The fight was on. What followed was a blur of adrenaline and terror. I moved, fired, retreated, driven by a desperation that drowned out any semblance of rational thought. A searing pain tore through my shoulder as claws raked my flesh. I stumbled, vision blurring, and fired blindly, the muzzle flash momentarily illuminating a fanged maw inches from my face. Another shriek pierced the air, followed by a heavy thud. Silence descended, broken only by my ragged breaths and the frantic pounding of my heart. When the haze faded, I saw two of the creatures lying motionless on the ground. The others had vanished into the trees, their eyes gleaming with a promise of retribution. I was battered and bleeding, but alive. I never went back to civilization. The authorities won't find me out here, and they wouldn't believe me even if they did. Sometimes I catch the scent of their foul musk near my camp. Sometimes I see flashes of yellow in the distant trees. They haven't given up, just like I haven't. This is my life now, a solitary battle waged in the shadows, an endless game of hunter and hunted. Most days, the fear keeps me sharp. Some nights, I wonder if this is any better than cowering in a corner, waiting for claws to tear through the walls. But out here, among the ancient trees and watchful stars, at least I have a fighting chance, at least I have some semblance of control. In every sunrise, every breath, is a spit in the face of those lurking horrors, a defiant act of survival in a world that shouldn't exist. My name is Colton Reed, and this happened to me back in 2008, my first summer as a lookout in the rugged Cascades of Washington State. Always been a nature lover, figured a season in the wilderness would be a blast, you know? My tower creaked and swayed on its perch, far above old-growth forests and glacier-fed rivers. The whole area had a primeval feel, the kind that sends a tingle down your spine. I wasn't wrong about that part. My first few weeks on shift were uneventful, mostly logging cloud formations and chatting with the other lookouts over the radio. Then, it started, a faint scratching sound coming from below my cabin at night. Figured it was a rodent, some raccoon looking for an easy handout. Didn't worry much until a few mornings later when I found a shredded supply bag on the porch. Not chewed open, slashed, with alarmingly big claws. Radioed it in, and they sent up Ben, a veteran, to take a look around. Ben got up there at dusk. He was skeptical, but thorough. We combed the area around my tower, 
looking for prints or scat or any sign of what ripped into my stuff. Found nothing. Yet, as the sun went down, that scratching started up again, closer this time. Probably a Martin, Ben reassured me. Big, mean little bastards. They sound monstrous in this kind of quiet. That explanation felt thin, but what else could it be? Ben set some traps, gave me a pat on the shoulder, and headed off down the trail right before nightfall. Never even offered to spend the night, though I didn't blame him. Once I was alone, the unease set in like frostbite. Tried reading to calm my nerves, but every rustle of leaves outside had me jumping. The battery in my headlamp was weak, the cabin bathed in flickering shadows. Then, I heard it, the scratching at the base of the tower, louder now. The flashlight beam danced as I slowly made my way to the window. Outside, in the limited glow, I saw it. Perched on a thick branch, not ten feet from my cabin, was the biggest damn bobcat I'd ever seen, if it even was a bobcat. Too tall, too lanky. Its limbs looked abnormally long, and the way it moved, smooth, and a little unsettling. But the eyes, they were pure yellow, reflecting the flashlight just like a predator's at night. The creature stared straight at me, as if sizing me up. My heart lodged in my throat. It hissed, a long, menacing sound that didn't seem to fit its size then effortlessly leaped down into the darkness. The scratching below stopped. I radioed for backup, but they wouldn't send anyone until daylight. Said it was a spooked animal, overactive imagination, all that jazz. The rest of the night was an adrenaline-fueled blur. I barricaded myself in, rifle clutched in my trembling hands. The scratching never returned, but I swore I could hear a rasping breath outside my door until dawn broke. First light, I crept outside. Nothing but silence and the dew on pine needles. They sent two rangers out to investigate. We scoured the area, looked for tracks, any signs to prove I wasn't crazy. They found a shred of my torn supply bag snagged on a branch, but nothing else to support my story. The rangers exchanged glances, the familiar ones that say newbie lost his marbles. The rest of the season was a haze of paranoia. Every night brought the scratching or a shadow flitting past the window. I'd see those burning yellow eyes in the trees, watching me started second-guessing everything. But without proof, I was just the lookout who went a bit feral his first time around. The worst, though, was the day I found Ben's hat. He'd come back out to check on me a week or so later, try to talk some sense into me. We took a hike along a seldom-used trail. That's when I saw the hat, his beat-up fedora, lying in a patch of huckleberry bushes. There were streaks of blood on it, dark and sticky. I tried to radio it in, to tell them something got Ben, but the words wouldn't come. He was out there, maybe hurt, maybe something worse, all because of whatever stalked those woods. In that moment, I knew no one would believe me, no one would venture out into that hushed green twilight to find him. I grabbed my gear and hiked out that day. Didn't look back at my tower, didn't care about the protocol or the penalties. I told myself they'd find Ben, that I did the right thing. But deep down, the guilt eats away at me, and the haunting image of those yellow eyes burning in the dark. I hitched a ride to the nearest town, the forest and oppressive presence in the rearview mirror. Never felt relief like that before, tainted as it was with shame. Figured I'd call him from town, 
make an anonymous report about finding Ben's hat, at least force them to send someone back out there. Instead, something compelled me to drive straight to Ben's place. It was a cabin on the edge of town, the kind of place only a seasoned woodsman would appreciate. His old truck sat in the gravel driveway. Knocked on the door, and a woman answered. Her name was Sarah, Ben's wife. She smiled, that hopeful smile that hadn't yet faded, but as I stumbled through explaining who I was, her expression shifted to a chilling mixture of dread and fury. Turns out they'd already reported Ben missing. He'd never returned home that night. You were the last one he saw, she accused, her voice shaking. I apologized, a useless word in the face of her pain. Told her everything, about the creature, the eyes, the blood, every damn detail I'd kept locked inside out of fear. When I reached the part about his hat, she broke down, sobs racking her body. That was when the resolve hardened in me. I couldn't bring Ben back, but I damn well wasn't going to let the thing that took him get away with it. The rangers were useless, so scared of looking foolish they were ready to let his disappearance fade into just another backwoods mystery. Sarah looked at me, and I guess she saw something echo her own desperate determination. We'll go ourselves, she said, her voice surprisingly strong. There's a trail Ben used sometimes, an old hunting route. We'll find him, find whatever did this. The hike back to my tower was surreal. We armed ourselves, more supplies than were strictly necessary, a silent acknowledgement that this wasn't a typical search and rescue. Every rustle of leaves was amplified. We followed the faint trail Ben took, me pointing out where I found his hat. Every step, the dread grew heavier. The sun was beginning its descent when we reached my clearing. The tower loomed like an accusation against the fading light. I swore I could smell a rank stench in the air, something sickly sweet mixed with rot. Sarah made a soft, horrified sound behind me. My supply cabin stood ransacked, the door hanging open on broken hinges. Scattered across the ground were my things, shredded and smeared with blood. Dark stains marred the porch. A chill ran down my spine. We exchanged a grim look. Whatever had done this was still nearby. We moved as one towards the tower. Slowly, cautiously, my rifle felt like dead weight in my hands. The scratching started just before we reached its base. Louder this time, more aggressive, like the creature was tearing into the wood itself. We circled the tower, eyes wide as we looked into the darkness at its base. Then, from the dense undergrowth, a pair of blazing yellow eyes pierced the gloom, reflecting our flashlights. The creature lunged, a blur of sinewy limbs and gaping, tooth-filled maw. I fired wildly, more out of panic than aim. Sarah screamed. The creature was, massive. Far taller than a man, its frame skeletal yet impossibly strong. Its fur was patchy, revealing taut, grayish skin. The head, it was dog-like but too elongated, the jaw too wide. And all the while, those predatory eyes burned with chilling intelligence. I fired again as the creature barreled towards Sarah. It yelled in pain, twisting slightly off course. That distraction was enough. Sarah scrambled back, fumbling with her handgun while I blindly reloaded. The creature retreated a step, but its eyes never left us, its ragged breaths echoing in the stillness. Run! I shouted at Sarah. We bolted for the trees, not daring to look back. 
gunshots and snarling echoed behind us. Branches whipped at my face, the dense forest closing around us. I could hear the creature pursuing us, its gait uneven from the gunshot. We ran until our lungs burned, until we couldn't tell if the pounding in our ears was our hearts or the creature closing in. We tripped out onto a gravel road, gasping for breath. A battered truck was parked there, thankfully unlocked. I fumbled for the keys as Sarah shouted. We piled in, slamming the doors even as the creature burst out of the tree line. I slammed the truck in gear, peeling away in a spray of gravel just as it reached the road. My shaking hands barely kept the truck steady. We didn't stop driving until we hit the outskirts of town. As dawn broke, we stumbled into the ranger station, disheveled and wild-eyed. We were covered in dirt, in blood. Sarah clung to what remained of Ben's hat. And in our eyes, they saw the truth mirrored. The rangers couldn't ignore the evidence any longer. They never found Ben's body nor the creature. The official story is a bear attack, maybe a rabid animal, driven mad by disease. They say Ben got lost, disoriented after the attack. Only I and Sarah know the truth, the terrifying reality lurking in the shadows of those ancient forests. Sometimes we catch a whiff of that rotten stench, hear a rustle too close to our windows, and we watch the wilderness with wary eyes. We haven't been back to the Cascades since, but I doubt the creature forgot about us. My name is Nolan Harris, and this happened to me back in the fall of 96. I was working as a fire lookout in the Sequoia National Forest, California big, rugged country with a view, and I was pretty darn happy with the gig. Sure, solitude gets to you after a while, but overall, I wasn't complaining. I had my books, my radio to keep up with news and the games, and enough supplies to keep me cozy in my little tower through the colder months. Cozy might be stretching it. The tower I was watching was a good old relic, metal struts, mostly glass paneling, and a tiny little space with just enough room for a cot, a propane stove, and my radio gear. The trees were so tall, they blocked out most of the light, turning the world below into a dim, greenish haze. Gave a guy time to think, I suppose. One afternoon, I decided to take a break from scanning the horizon for smoke. Grabbed one of my old paperbacks and settled onto the ledge outside my tower. The air had a crisp chill to it, but the sun still offered a bit of warmth. Peaceful, it was. Just as I was starting to doze off, a flicker of movement below caught my eye. Must have been a bear, digging around in the brush. Only, it seemed too upright, too quick. It moved like a person scrambling up the slope. I grabbed my binoculars and focused. I saw ragged clothes and a lot of dirt, but there was something off. The features, the way the thing moved, it didn't make sense. Hello? I called out, keeping a firm grip on the binoculars. The figure froze. It cocked its head, listening. My heart started thumping like a drum solo. If it was a person, they were in rough shape. Then, the thing let out a sound, a kind of rattling, guttural growl, and disappeared into the undergrowth. I was too stunned to speak. The rest of the day passed in a blur. My mind raced. Was that a lost hiker, someone mentally disturbed? Or was I being too logical about this? I kept remembering the figure's eyes, dark and glinting, peering at me from beneath matted, sweat-soaked hair. 
They weren't the eyes of a desperate person, but of something, calculating. I couldn't get the image out of my head. That night brought fitful sleep, punctuated by every snapping twig and creak of the tower. I started questioning everything. It's amazing how easily the mind tricks you into believing things you know aren't real, especially alone in the wilderness. Next morning, I couldn't ignore the sense of unease any longer. I radioed my superiors, described what I saw, and requested a patrol unit. After a lot of back and forth, they reluctantly agreed to send a ranger to check out the area. Ranger Owens showed up three days later. He seemed less than amused with my story. After a quick hike around the tower, he came back empty-handed. You probably saw a bear, Nolan, he said with a patronizing chuckle. They can be sneaky in the woods. I tried to argue, to describe the creature's odd features in those eyes, but Owens just shook his head. Clearly, he thought I'd cracked from the isolation. Humiliated and frustrated, I eventually let it go. But a nagging doubt remained, a voice whispering that what I saw wasn't an animal. That night, I decided to keep vigil. I sat outside on the ledge, my rifle close by, eyes glued to the dim tangle of trees below. For a while, all was quiet just the wind rustling through the leaves. Then, I saw it. The creature was crouched near the treeline, its form a silhouette against the fading sunlight. Its head twitched and swiveled, like an owl scanning for prey. My palms went clammy, but I raised the rifle, trying to steady my breathing and sight down the barrel. Its movement was uncanny, not like a lumbering bear but quick, agile. I could see its wiry limbs, the hunched back that made it seem taller than it was. It looked directly at me. That was it. I didn't hesitate. I squeezed the trigger. The crack of the rifle tore through the air. The creature let out a startled screech, a piercing sound that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. It bolted toward the tree line, moving with inhuman speed, then vanished. I sat there, shaking, staring into the woods. Did I hit it? I hadn't seen any blood. For the rest of the night, the forest seemed unnaturally silent, like everything was holding its breath. Morning brought some relief. I radioed headquarters and urgently requested a team. This time, there was less hesitation, a hint of concern in my supervisor's voice. I paced impatiently as the search team arrived, a mix of park rangers and trackers. We scoured the area, our boots crunching over dry leaves and fallen branches. Every snapping twig, every rustle of leaves had me on edge. We found nothing. After hours of searching, they had to call it off. No blood, no tracks. Just my word that something had been out there. I saw the doubt in their eyes, the way they looked at me like I was some paranoid old fool. I spent another restless night, filled with whispers of doubt about my own sanity. The next morning, radio reports came buzzing in a hiker missing in a nearby section of the park. A young woman, last seen at a camping spot a few miles away from my tower. A shiver ran down my spine. Was there a connection? Did that thing in the woods have something to do with it? I grabbed the radio and demanded they restart the search in the area around my tower. My supervisor's voice crackled through the static, filled with concern now. Nolan, are you sure about? And then I heard it. A rustling noise, a branch snapping just below the ridge near my tower. 
my voice tightened with dread, something is down here. I swear, it's... The transmission cut off in a burst of static, replaced by a shriek that echoed across the valley. A shriek that wasn't human. The rangers on the other end went from concern to full-blown alarm. I heard yells, someone ordering a full mobilization, the sounds of trucks roaring to life. Then, a voice came over the radio, tight and urgent. Nolan! Get inside the tower. Lock the damn door, and do not come out. Is that clear? I stumbled back inside the tower, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. With trembling fingers, I slammed the bolt lock and slumped to the floor, rifle clutched in sweaty hands. Outside, I heard movement, heavy footfalls circling the metal base of my tower. Then, something scraped against the tower leg, a sharp, metallic sound that sent a fresh wave of panic through me. It was trying to climb. Minutes felt like hours. Sweat poured down my face as I aimed the rifle at the door, the only way in or out of this glass box. Then, the banging started. Hard, rhythmic thuds against the flimsy door followed by that eerie scratching. The metal hinges groaned in protest. Over the radio, I heard a cacophony of shouts and engine noises growing closer. Then came the unmistakable crack of gunfire. The creature howled, an almost wounded sound, more enraged than hurt. The pounding on the door stopped, replaced by the frantic scrambling of whatever it was trying to retreat. I rushed to the window. The rangers were converging, forming a perimeter around the tower. They looked terrified, weapons raised as they scanned the trees. From higher up, I could see it now. The creature was half hidden in the thick foliage, its dark eyes fixed on the armed group below. It let out a guttural snarl, bearing a set of teeth far too sharp to be human. The next moments were a blur. A standoff ensued, the armed rangers holding a defensive line, the creature pacing and growling, caught in the ring of encroaching headlights. I watched frozen in horror as it launched forward in a surprise attack, taking down one of the rangers in a flurry of claws and teeth. The gunshots were almost deafening, the air filled with the smell of gunpowder and something else, a foul, musky scent. The beast howled again, this time in pain. It staggered back, clutching a bleeding wound. Then, with a final glare aimed squarely at my tower, it turned and disappeared into the darkening forest. In the aftermath, I was left with a sickening jumble of horror and confusion. The rangers found the body of the missing hiker, mangled beyond recognition. They also discovered a makeshift den hidden deeper in the woods. Scraps of clothing, bones, evidence suggesting this wasn't the first victim. I was questioned relentlessly, but they couldn't make sense of what I described, couldn't find any animal matching the creature I saw. They called in cryptozoologists, wildlife experts, anyone willing to investigate these strange events. Yet, just like before, they came up empty-handed. The official explanation was a rogue bear attack, amplified by isolation playing tricks on my mind. I was transferred out of the tower, deemed unfit for duty after a compulsory psych evaluation. Some whisper it was pity, others say it was a cover-up. Either way, my days as a fire lookout were over. The tower stands empty now. Nobody has dared to replace me. I moved away, tried to start anew. But even now, years later, I can't shake the feeling of being watched. I hear those rustling sounds in the darkness, 
sometimes swear I glimpse a hunched figure out of the corner of my eye. And I'll never forget those eyes. They haunt my nightmares, a constant reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved, some corners of the wild should remain forever untouched. My name is Rhett Miller, and this happened to me in August of 1994. Back then, I was working as a fire lookout in the Deschutes National Forest in Oregon. It's a beautiful stretch of wilderness, towering pines, volcanic mountains, and the kind of endless sky that makes you feel small. I'd been out there two summers already and loved the solitude, the rhythm of the job. My wife, bless her heart, she wasn't crazy about it. Hated me being so far away for months at a time. But, it was good money, and I liked to think I was doing something important. That summer, though, things got a bit strange. It started small. Little things. One morning, I found a deer carcass near my tower. Not unusual, but this one, it was off. Like something had sucked the blood right out of it, and there were these tiny puncture wounds on its neck. I reported it to the ranger station, but no one seemed too worried. Predators get hungry, they do weird things sometimes, right? Then, I started hearing noises. Up in my tower at night, there'd be scratching at the base, branches snapping, the occasional howl that didn't quite sound like a coyote. I'd shine my light down, but there was nothing there. Nothing but the inky dark woods stretching out forever. One night, it came up the steps. Whatever it was, it was big and heavy. I heard the wood creaking under its weight, the rattle of claws on the metal rungs. I grabbed my rifle heart pounding in my chest. I flipped on the floodlight, and there it was. Crouched on the landing, the monstrous shape was backlit by the blinding glare. Thick, coarse for the color of dried mud clung to its emaciated body. Its long, deformed arms ended in claws like rusteds. The head, it looked like a wolf's skull, stretched and twisted impossibly long, filled with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes burned yellow in the reflected light. We just stared at each other, both of us frozen for one terrifying moment. Then it lunged. I slammed the door shut, a splintering crack echoing as one of those claws just barely missed snagging my arm. I heard it scrabble against the metal, the guttural snarl sending shivers down my spine. I backed away, fumbling with the rifle. I lined up a shot through the door's small window and fired. The creature screeched. I heard it tumble down the ladder, branches cracking, and then silence. Slowly, I crept back to the window and peered outside. Nothing. No blood, no body, just the empty night. I waited there until the sun came up, but the creature didn't return. The next morning, I radioed for backup. Told them everything, the carcass, the noises, the attack. At first, there was just static. Then, my supervisor's voice came through, tight and hesitant. Rat, listen. I ain't saying I believe you, but you get your stuff together and come on down. We'll figure this out. Two rangers, Amelia and Ben, arrived later that day. They were both good folks, people I trusted. I showed them the splintered door, the deep claw marks. Amelia went a bit pale, but Ben just gave me a concerned frown. Bear? He suggested, even though we both knew it hadn't been one. Maybe a cougar with some kind of disease, Amelia added, trying to sound helpful. 
I knew they didn't fully believe me, and I couldn't blame them. It sounded crazy. I started to question my own sanity. But I knew what I saw. Still, part of me was relieved. I wouldn't be out there alone anymore. That night, we hunkered down in my tower, armed to the teeth. I told stories to pass the time, trying to distract myself from the gnawing fear in my gut. Ben offered a flask of something strong for the nerves, and I almost took it, but something made me hesitate. Around midnight, the noises started. Scratching, the thud of something heavy circling the tower. I gripped my rifle, watching the shadows below with wide eyes. Amelia and Ben exchanged glances, tense. Suddenly, Ben swore and pointed to the window. There, pressed against the glass, was a face, not an animal's face. A man's face, gaunt and filthy, but undeniably human. Except for the eyes. They were the same glowing yellow as the creatures. It's him, he's one of them. I shouted, a surge of adrenaline and terror coursing through me. Amelia fired her shotgun, shattering the glass. The face disappeared with a startled yelp. Ben rushed to the window, firing blindly into the darkness. We heard crashes, branches snapping, but when we shone the lights down, there was nothing to see. The rest of that night was a blur. More screeches, more shadows darting at the edge of our vision. Just before dawn, they finally retreated. When the light came, we ventured outside cautiously. There were footprints, or something like them. Long, clawed tracks leading away from the tower and disappearing deep into the trees. No blood, no sign of the creature, or the man we had seen. The ranger station sent a search team. They scoured the area for days, but found nothing. The official report stated possible animal attack with a side note of suspected mental breakdown on my part. They hauled me down to the valley, got me checked into a hospital. I spent two weeks under observation, poked, prodded, questioned by a worried-looking psychiatrist. They cleared me, physically anyway. Mentally, that was another story. The doc recommended time away from the job, rest, quiet. My wife, she was relieved, but also vindicated. All she ever wanted was me home. And in my heart, I knew I couldn't go back to that tower, not after what I'd seen. We moved to a small coastal town far away from those mountains and their shadowed depths. I got a job in construction, nothing fancy, but it paid the bills. For a while, things were almost normal. I'd wake up without my heart in my throat, and the nightmares began to fade. But, I noticed things. Subtle things. The way the light caught in a homeless man's eyes a fleeting flash of yellow before he looked away. The too quick shuffle of a figure at the edge of my vision in a crowded market. And always, the feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes tracking my every move. It became an obsession, this paranoia. I started researching local folklore, myths of wild men in the woods. What I found wasn't comforting. These stories, from native tribes all the way up to modern-day local disappearances, shared a common thread, people venturing into certain woods and never coming back. And then, there was Eliza. She was a young woman, a hiker, who went missing in the state park just north of our town. The news reports sent shivers down my spine. The way they described her last known location, the scant evidence they found, it was like a chilling echo of my own story. 
I couldn't just sit and do nothing. I drove up to the park, telling my wife I needed to clear my head. Once there, I ventured off the marked trails, going deeper under the shadowed canopy of ancient trees. I carried my old hunting rifle, more out of habit than anything. There was no sound, only a suffocating silence heavier than any in the national forest. Every creak of a branch had me whirling around, my hands clammy on my gun. I came across a clearing, and there, in the center, was a crude altar of bones. Bleached skulls of small animals sat atop it, meticulously arranged. I froze. This was their mark, I was sure of it. That's when I heard it, the ragged breathing, the rustling of leaves. They were close. Too close. I retreated, backpedaling through the undergrowth, trying to stay calm. And then the ground gave way under me. I tumbled down a hidden slope into a pit. Before I could scramble out, they were above me. Shapes silhouetted against the sliver of sky. There was the creature, its ragged form more monstrous than I remembered, and others, the ones with the glowing eyes. Men, at least once, but twisted and changed by this place. The creature descended into the pit, slow and deliberate. I raised my rifle, more out of desperation than hope, and fired until the gun clicked empty. Snarls and guttural cries answered each shot, but they kept coming. The last thing I remember is the flash of those yellow eyes in the darkness, lunging towards me, those bone-white teeth gleaming in the gloom. When the search and rescue team finally found me, days later, they said it was a miracle I was alive. The pit was deep, filled with branches that cushioned my fall. My injuries were severe, and so was the official story. I'd wandered off, got lost, and had a nasty fall. No one mentions the gouges in the earth, too large and deep to be made by any known bear. No one mentions the bits of coarse, wiry hair tangled in my shattered watch band. Sometimes, late at night, I still think I hear them. A faint scratching at the window, the shuffle of footsteps across the roof. My wife rolls her eyes, chalks it up to trauma. Maybe she's right. But then, those reports crop up in the news, another missing hiker, a sighting of something strange and feral lurking at the edge of civilization. It chills me to the bone. Because some secrets, some horrors, aren't meant to stay hidden. The woods remember. The creature remembers. And somewhere out there, under the indifferent stars, they wait. My name's Grant, and this happened to me back in 2019, deep in the heart of Montana's Glacier National Park. Always figured a lookout gig was about as peaceful as you could get, with endless views and nothing but your own thoughts for company. Funny how wrong you can be. It started small, like most things do. Little stuff rustles in the night, those feelings of being watched when I was out on patrol. Chalker it up to an overactive imagination at first. Loneliness does strange things to a mind. Then came the carcass. A deer, halfway up a supply route. Not a normal kill, flesh torn and stripped in odd places, bones splintered with unnatural force. No bear or cougar did that. Whatever it was, it had power, and a disturbing kind of precision. Radioed it in, got the official park service response, poachers, or maybe a weird predator attack. Play it down, keep the tourists happy, that sort of thing. Should have listened to that nagging feeling in my gut, packed up and left. 
but I'd grown fond of my tower, fond of the stark beauty of the place. Besides, part of me, a reckless part, was curious. The next few weeks were an uneasy blur. Sounds got closer at night, heavy footfalls that stopped unnaturally close to the tower, guttural breathing right under my window. Sleep became a fitful thing, broken by every snap of a twig or howl of the wind. Found more tracks too, enormous ones with clawed toes. Whatever made them walked upright, and I started packing my rifle alongside my gear for patrols. Then Harris happened. Harris was a fellow lookout, tower a few valleys over. Cheerful fella, bit too trusting for this job. I warned him after the deer carcass, told him I heard things out in the woods. His radio went silent a few days afterward. Search party went out, came back with a mangled radio and not much else. Official explanation was a bear gone rogue, but I knew better. It watched me after that, bolder now. A flicker of movement at the tree lean, its form hulking and grotesque. Or the gleam of eyes, startlingly yellow against the inky dark, observing my tower from the shadows. One evening, as the sun dipped below the jagged peaks, I saw it clearly. Skin stretched tight over bone, a skeletal monstrosity built for unnatural power. It moved with a predator's grace, a nightmare given flesh. When our eyes met, everything in me screamed to run, to hide. But some stubborn part of me stood firm. I wasn't just some cowering prey anymore. Nights became a waiting game. It circled my tower, testing the defenses. I boarded up the bottom story windows, stacked supplies, and waited. The scratching started soon after, relentless and grating. Some nights it retreated. Other nights, the scratching turned into heavy thuds. It was trying to break in, trying to get to me. One night, just as the first streaks of dawn were breaking through, it changed tactics. Silence fell over the woods. No scratching, no growls. Even the usual chirp of birdsong was absent. That oppressive silence was more chilling than any assault. Then, from behind the tower, came a new sound. A scream, cut short in a gurgle of terror. I recognized the voice, Keaton, a rookie assigned to a nearby hiking trail for the summer. My heart hammered a desperate rhythm. The creature had changed its tactics. It knew I wouldn't abandon my post, but maybe it could lure me out. The screams echoed in my memory, a chilling testament to the creature's relentless cruelty. With shaking hands, I grabbed my rifle and edged towards the tower's window. Just as I peered over the sill, the creature came bounding out of the woods, but not towards my tower. It snatched up something from the ground, Keaton's backpack, a smear of blood vivid against the faded green canvas. Then, with unnatural speed, it vanished back into the trees. It was playing with me, wearing me down. Panic thrummed through my veins, but a cold, desperate resolve took root. It wanted a chase, wanted me to break. I wouldn't give it that satisfaction. I had one last card to play, one reckless gamble that might just buy me enough time. Barricading myself inside the tower was a fool's game. Sooner or later, it would tear through, and I'd be trapped. No, if I was going out, I was going out on my own terms. I gathered anything flammable, supplies, old maps, kerosene from the generator. The plan forming in my head was part madness, part desperation. But out there in the wilds of Montana, with that unholy thing hunting me, 
maybe a touch of madness was the only way to survive. I worked fast, adrenaline-fueled focus drowning out the fear. Soaked rags in kerosene, stuffing them around the base of the tower. Matches were secured, my rifle strapped across my back. Escape route? There wasn't one. It was either this, or dying cornered like a rat. Outside, the woods stayed ominously silent. Had it abandoned the chase, or was it waiting, watching my frantic preparations with that terrifying intelligence? Didn't matter. Time was running out. I struck the match, and tossed it. Flame roared up the tower's base. The old wood, dried by mountain sun, took the spark with horrifying eagerness. Black smoke billowed skyward, a stark distress beacon set against the pristine wilderness. The creature wouldn't ignore this. Heart pounding a frantic tattoo, I scrambled onto the tower's narrow roof. Below, flames devoured the supports. One less way in, but also one less way out for me. Now all I could do was wait, and pray the wind stayed calm that the fire didn't climb high enough to trap me before help arrived. If it arrived. The wait seemed eternal, each crackle of wood, each shift of the smoke, fueling my terror. How long would it take the creature to notice? How long till the rescue team spotted my desperate signal? Minutes stretched into hours, my skin prickling with a mix of sweat and rising panic. If the fire didn't kill me, the anticipation just might. Finally, the first sign. Not the chop of helicopter blades I desperately craved, but a guttural screech echoing from the woods. It had found its hunting ground ablaze. Moments later, it burst from the tree lean. A monstrous silhouette framed by flame, in its eyes, they burned with an icy fury. The creature stalked towards the tower, movements jerky with rage. It wasn't used to losing control, its plans thwarted. For a brief, insane moment, something like satisfaction flared through me. Maybe, just maybe, this gamble would pay off. Then it changed direction. Leaping with impossible agility, it began scaling a nearby pine moving not towards me, but up, aiming for a way onto the tower's roof. Ice water replaced the surge of adrenaline in my veins. No way down, fire below, and that monstrous hunter closing in. The helicopter appeared a second later, flashing lights piercing the smoke. Shouting voices carried down. I waved frantically, praying they'd see me in the chaos. The creature, distracted, swung its head toward the new intrusion. For a heartbeat, it seemed to hesitate, torn between its prey and this new threat. I seized my chance. Flinging myself across the rooftop, I grabbed the emergency rope dangling from the helicopter. The pilot, bless him, must have read my intent. The aircraft dipped lower the rope scraping against the burning roof as I clung on with desperate strength. A roar of fury echoed below as the creature launched itself towards me, claws scrabbling at the helicopter's struts. The aircraft lifted just in time. I glimpsed it then, leaping into the flames, a horrifying silhouette consumed by its own burning trap. As the helicopter swung away over the inferno, I stared down at the tower. It was a pyre now, collapsing in on itself. I said a silent goodbye to Harris and Keaton, and whoever else likely died beneath the hungry gaze of that unholy creature. The aftermath? Predictable. Hushed voices, sanitized reports, and the inevitable transfer to a desk job where the worst monster I'd face would be bureaucratic red tape. 
They called it PTSD, shell shock. They offered therapy sessions and mumbled platitudes about moving on, finding normalcy again. But they didn't see what I saw. Didn't hear the rasping breaths in every lonely shadow or feel the phantom touch of claws on a sleepless night. The wilderness, once my sanctuary, is forever tainted now. Because out there, under the vast expanse of the Montana sky, the world feels bigger, wilder, and full of dark corners where the old stories, the ones about creatures of myth and nightmare, might hold a terrible sliver of truth. Some part of me knows, they aren't all gone. They're just waiting, watching, and the boundary between our world and theirs is thinner than we'd ever like to admit. My name's Reed Palmer, and this happened to me back in 2009, while stationed in the Colorado Rockies. A veteran lookout, or so I thought. Seen my share of wildlife, weathered some nasty storms, handled the solitude better than most. Turns out, nothing prepares you for the things that lurk in the shadows, things the guidebooks don't prepare you for. Started with the ravens. Normally, just bold scavengers, nothing unusual. But they began acting strange a few weeks back, circling my tower, squawking in this unnerving, discordant way that set my teeth on edge. At dusk, they'd settle on the railing, their beady eyes staring at me through the glass like they were expecting something. Then came a late-season snowstorm. Not uncommon for the area but this one whipped up with unusual ferocity. My radio crackled with reports from the other lookouts, most hunkering down, waiting for it to pass. Through the swirling white, I caught a glimpse of movement, something big and dark slinking around the base of my tower. A bear out of hibernation early, maybe? Seemed too tall, too lean. As night fell, the storm worsened, the tower buffeted by brutal winds. That's when I heard it, the scratching. Low against the door, persistent. My heart pounded against my ribs. Bear wouldn't do that. This was deliberate, testing. The scratching went on for hours. I finally drifted into a fitful sleep, exhausted, rifle clutched in white-knuckled hands. Woke up to a silence so complete it was more terrifying than the storm. My tower seemed to hold its breath. Mustering my courage, I crept to the window. The world was an untouched expanse of pristine snow. No tracks, nothing. Except on my front porch, there were ragged gouges in the wood and a smear of something dark, blood? The unease in my gut solidified. Whatever visited me in the night wasn't some lost animal. Radioed base camp. Garbled voices cut in and out through the static, other lookouts reporting weird happenings too. Ravens swarming their towers, a sense of being watched, that same gnawing unease I felt in my bones. Then, the transmission from Jenkins cut through the crackling airwaves. He sounded panicked, breathless. Something's out here. Jesus, it's, I don't. His voice cut off, replaced by a shriek that chilled me to the core. It didn't sound human. The other outposts called out to Jenkins, but only frantic, echoing silence answered. My supervisor, his voice tight, ordered everyone to stay put, conserve ammo, wait for backup. The dread coiled in my chest, a cold, heavy thing. As dusk began to settle, I saw it. Leaping across the clearing below with impossible speed and agility, heading towards Jenkins' post. Too tall for a wolf, too low to the ground for a bear. 
and the way it moved, smooth, yet jerky and unnatural. Its skin looked hairless in the fading light, taut over impossibly long limbs. The head, it swung towards my tower, and I saw those eyes, a malevolent yellow that pierced the gathering gloom. My hand trembled as I reached for the rifle. My supervisor was on the radio again, trying to raise Jenkins, and then shouting for us to hold our ground, that a ranger team was on their way. But how long would they take? What would happen when they got there? Jenkins' scream still echoed in my mind. The creature stopped at the base of Jenkins' tower. It circled and then reared back, striking at the structure with surprising force. The old wood groaned in protest. I took aim, heart pounding, and squeezed the trigger. The creature yowled, twisting away in a blur of movement. It didn't stop. Again and again, it slammed into the side of the tower, the whole structure rattling violently. On the radio, more shouting, more calls for Jenkins. I aimed again as the creature lunged, its long, clawed fingers scrabbling at the windows. The rifle roared in my hands, the muzzle flash momentarily illuminating the snow. The creature let out a piercing screech and retreated, weaving unnaturally through the trees. Shaking, I radioed in, my voice ragged. I'd hit it, but it didn't seem to slow the thing down at all. Help wouldn't arrive until morning, that much was clear. The radio sputtered with panicked reports, glimpses of the creature, other towers under siege. It was out there, relentless and terrifying, and it was coming for us. As darkness tightened its grip, fear gnawed at my insides. Every rustle of leaves, Every snap of a wind-blown branch sent my heart leaping into my throat. The creature was toying with us, testing our defenses. Shots echoed through the night from other towers, followed by unsettling silence. I huddled in my tower, surrounded by the flimsy illusion of safety. The night stretched into an eternity of strained breaths and panicked bursts on the radio. Sometime past midnight, the attack stopped. Eerie silence settled over the forest, heavier than the snowfall. It was just a respite, I knew. Whatever was hunting us was intelligent, biding its time. Dawn broke slowly, revealing a blood-stained landscape. Two towers stood empty. The radio crackled to life. My supervisor, his voice haggard, ordered us to gather supplies and descend our posts. We were to converge on an old ranger station, a solid stone structure that offered more protection. We had to stick together, whatever the cost. The climb down was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Every shadow seemed filled with lurking menace, every crunch of snow under my boots seemed to echo through the woods. The world felt stark and empty, devoid of any sign of life except the lingering dread. We reached the ranger station just as the sun dipped below the horizon. Three of us made it. The old building seemed like a fortress compared to our towers. We barricaded ourselves in, sharing what little supplies we had. The night descended quickly. From the second floor windows, we saw the flickering of those awful yellow eyes in the darkness. They moved from tower to tower, a silent pack circling starving prey. The ranger station had a phone, and we desperately tried to call for help. Nothing. The lines were dead. We were cut off, utterly alone. They knew what they were doing, these creatures. Isolating us, toying with us, and there was nothing we could do but wait for the final onslaught.
hours passed in a tense haze of half-whispered stories and grim silences. We all knew how this would likely end, huddled in this old stone building on the edge of a desolate wilderness. It was just before dawn when the first scream shattered the silence. One of the lookouts, a woman named Harper, had been keeping watch on the back entrance. The creatures had found a way in. We heard thuds, snarls, and Harper's desperate cries for help. Then, a chilling silence. The two of us who remained pressed ourselves back into the farthest corner of the room. My mind raced. There was nowhere left to run, no escape, and the flimsy barricade on the door wouldn't hold. We were sitting ducks in this trap. A scraping sound came from the floorboards below. Claws working their way through, the smell of wet fur and something rank flooding the room. I raised the rifle, hands shaking violently. Suddenly, from outside, a new sound tore through the night, the whine of sirens, fast approaching. Shouts echoed through the trees as headlights pierced the darkness. The creatures screeched in rage, scrambling away as the rescuers arrived. They found us huddled together, barely breathing. The ranger station looked like a war zone, and I don't think any of us ever really recovered from what we saw. The aftermath is a blur of debriefings, medical tests, and those endless, pitying looks from the officials. They labeled the incident an unexplained wildlife attack, blamed our trauma-addled minds for the more horrifying details. The rest of us from that night, we know better. Talked about it at first, swore we'd find answers, forced them to acknowledge the truth. But the world has a way of moving on. People have a way of dismissing things that don't fit into their neat boxes. We're the crazy lookouts now, the ones who saw things that can't exist. I never went back to the service. Settled down to a quiet life, as quiet as it can be when you're always looking over your shoulder. The Rockies haven't seen me since, but that doesn't mean the creatures forgot. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear a rasping breath outside my window, or catch a flicker of unnatural yellow in the distant tree line. The only real proof I have is the scars, physical ones from the claws that nearly shredded Harper, and the deeper ones no doctor can see. They tell the story the officials tried to bury, a story of shadows and impossible creatures and the stark realization that the wilderness holds far more terrifying secrets than any of us are truly equipped to handle. My name's Grant Miller, and this happened to me back in 2019 in the wilds of Montana's Glacier National Park. Always loved the outdoors, Worked as a park ranger before taking the lookout gig. Figured it'd be a nice change of pace. The first weeks up in my tower were blissful. Views that put postcards to shame, the crisp air, the sense of solitude, it was a little slice of paradise. Then Harris showed up. One of the other lookouts. Figured he was just swinging by to check in on the rookie. Dude was, kind of intense. Talked a mile a minute, mostly about conspiracy stuff, sightings folks didn't like to discuss out loud. Bigfoot, weird lights in the sky, you name it. I laughed it off, thinking he was messing with me. It's a lonely job. You start to see things that might not be there after a while. A week later, I saw the lights myself. Not in the sky, down in the valley. Flickering, not campfire friendly. Wrong color too, a strange bluish tinge. They moved fast, weaving in and out of the trees. Radioed it in, said it was probably poachers or some kids messing around. 
My supervisor was skeptical, but there was nothing to do in the dead of night. I drifted off to sleep, uneasy for the first time since setting foot in that tower. The next morning, I started finding the carcasses. Not many, but enough to send a chill through me. Small animals, but something about how they were ripped open, not on, it wasn't right. No sign of bears or wolves, no clean kills. I chalked it up to a rogue coyote with a taste for messy meals, but it gnawed at the back of my mind. Another week passed. Every night, those lights appeared, closer and more erratic each time. The unease settled into bone-deep dread. Then, Harris came back on the radio. His voice was a jittery squeak, nothing like his usual boisterous self. Grant, I'm up by Kootenay Peak. Something got my dog, something big. Jesus, Grant, you gotta hear this. The transmission was cut short by a strangled scream. It echoed chillingly through the staticky silence, followed by the sound of heavy footfalls crashing through the forest. My blood ran cold. I tried calling him back, tried contacting any of the other lookouts. Nothing. Just the same eerie quiet. The sun was setting, painting the sky with streaks of blood red and gold as I finally made the decision. I couldn't just sit and wait for whatever got Harris to turn its attention my way. Snagged my rifle, checked my pack, and headed down the ladder. Dusk was settling over the forest as I set off towards Kootenay Peak. Harris's last radio burst played over and over in my mind. Night fell quickly in the backcountry. The forest closed in, all shadows and rustles. Up ahead, I saw a flicker of blue light. Heart pounding, I eased off the trail, keeping to the dense undergrowth. As I drew closer, a strange smell hit me, musty, a bit like wet dog, but wrong. The clearing at the base of the peak was bathed in the eerie blue glow. Movement caught my eye, a hunched form crouched over, something. My heart lodged in my throat as it turned towards me. It stood impossibly tall, legs too long, arms dragging near the ground. The face, it looked almost canine, but warped, stretched into a horrifying parody of a wolf. In the eyes, yellow, shining with a strange hunger as they fixed on me. The creature let out a low, guttural growl, and a ripple of movement came from the shadows behind it. I made out a second set of those eyes, then a third. A pack. Fear propelled me into action. I raised the rifle, aimed more out of panic than any real plan, and fired. The creature screeched, a sound that set my teeth on edge. It thrashed, momentarily caught in the light, and I saw mottled, hairless skin pulled taut over bone. The others scattered into the trees, their eyes flashing like angry fireflies. I turned and ran. Stumbled and fell on the uneven ground, rifle flying from my numb fingers. I scrambled back up, blind terror overriding the pain in my scraped-up palms. The creatures were closing in, their snarls echoing through the woods. A low branch whipped across my face, nearly knocking me over. Something, one of the creatures, crashed into the brush beside me, causing me to stumble again. Just as I thought the thing might leap at me, I heard a gunshot ring out across the clearing. A man burst from the trees, his yellow ragged counterpoint to the creature's growls. It was Harris, shotgun in hand and eyes blazing. Run, he shouted, firing again toward the tree line. I didn't need to be told twice. We sprinted in the opposite direction, 
the monstrous howls a symphony of rage at our heels. The ground tore beneath our feet as we fled through the moonlit forest. Branches tore at our clothes, but we barely felt it, driven by the adrenaline coursing through our veins. Harris, surprisingly for a guy given to wild theories, seemed to know where he was going. We scrambled up a ravine and down the other side, the howls echoing behind us, thankfully growing fainter. Finally, just as my lungs threatened to give out, we stumbled onto a familiar trail. We kept going until the first light of dawn painted the sky. Only then did we collapse, gasping for breath and trembling from the ordeal. Harris pulled a half-empty flask from his pack, offering it to me. I took a grateful swig, the fiery whiskey burning a path down my throat. Those weren't coyotes, I choked out, voice rough. Harris nodded grimly. No, they weren't. I saw them, back when my dog, he trailed off, face contorted in grief. Never saw anything like them. Thought I was going crazy. We both did, I admitted, the pieces finally clicking into a nightmarish hole. His wild stories, the lights, the shredded carcasses, it all made horrific sense. We limped back to civilization, bodies battered and psyche shattered. The official report described our harrowing encounter as an animal attack, specifics unknown. Harris filled it with details of the creatures, their size, their skeletal forms, the awful, glowing eyes. They read the report, eyes widening, then dismissed it as the ramblings of traumatized men. Harris left the service soon after. Quietly, without fanfare. I heard he moved to some remote cabin in Alaska. Can't say I blame him. I tried to put it behind me too. Moved on to a less isolated posting, surrounded myself with people and noise. The nightmares came for a long time, the snarls, the yellow eyes burning in the dark. Some nights, I'd jolt awake, swearing I smelled that rank, musty odor or heard a rustle outside my window. But as the years passed, the nightmares faded into a dull ache, the memory tucked away in a dusty corner of my mind. Then, a few months ago, I was on patrol when I stumbled upon a deer carcass. Not a typical kill, it was torn open the same way as those ones back on Kootenay Peak. Panic, bone deep and primal, washed over me. I scanned the woods, searching for the familiar flicker of eyes, the impossibly lanky silhouettes. The woods remained stubbornly silent. I reported it voice shaking despite my efforts to stay calm. The rangers who responded seemed skeptical, even more so when I described what I saw that night in Glacier. Maybe they noticed how my hands trembled, how my eyes darted towards the shadows. One of them, a fresh-faced kid, said, probably just a sick cougar. I wanted to believe him. But somewhere in the deepest, most animal part of me, a flicker of recognition stirred. They never found whatever did that to the deer. The official report lists it as an unknown predator, another line in a dusty file. The local papers ran a short article, something about a mysterious creature stalking the area. Some commenters joked about Bigfoot, others swore they'd seen weird lights too. I haven't been sleeping well lately. Keep a rifle loaded by my bed. Check the window locks twice, thrice, always expecting to see a flicker of movement out there in the night. There's a part of me that craves answers, that wants to hunt those things down, prove to the world that they're real, that the nightmares weren't just in our heads. But mostly, a terrified part of me knows that we got damn lucky up on that peak. 
that sometimes, the greatest mercy is the ignorance of the wider world, the comfort of calling something a mystery rather than facing the awful truth. Some things lurk in the shadows for a reason. In the wilderness, vast and ancient, holds more secrets than any of us are meant to know. My name's Kate, and this happened to me back in 2016 in the dense redwood forests of Northern California. City kid turned lookout, figured it would be a nice change of pace. Turns out, nothing prepares you for the things that lurk in real wilderness, the kind they don't put in guidebooks. Started with the hikers. A couple straggling below my tower, looking lost. Should have radioed it in, but I was a newbie, figured I'd offer some directions, keep an eye on them from up top. They were grateful, overly so. Something about their smiles, too wide, a little too sharp, set my teeth on edge. By nightfall, an uneasy feeling settled over me. The normal forest sounds seemed muted, like something was holding its breath. That's when I saw it. Leaping from tree to tree far below, not a bear or a big cat, it was too tall, limbs too long. Its skin looked corpse pale, hairless, stretched tight over sinewy muscles. My binoculars caught a flash of yellow in the fading light. Eyes, staring right at my tower with horrifying intensity. Sleep didn't come easy that night. The thing stayed below, circling my tower, sometimes letting out a low rasping sound that made my skin crawl. Radio was useless, just a crackle of static. I was on my own. Tried to chalk it up to stress, too much isolation. But deep down, I knew I wasn't crazy. Come morning, I'd venture down with my rifle and find tracks proof to myself I wasn't losing my mind. But there was nothing. No prints, no broken branches, nothing to explain the terror I felt in my bones. Then came the noises from below the tower's floorboards. Scratching, persistent. Low growls that rose into piercing shrieks at odd moments. At night, the thing would claw at the door, testing its strength. Every day, I expected the final assault. The breaking point came when the hikers returned. They'd stayed at a campground down in the valley, I saw their tent from my tower. Same unsettling smiles, but this time there was something else in their eyes, a predatory gleam. My tower was a trap, and they knew it. We brought a friend, the man called out, his voice carrying a chilling cheerfulness. From the tree lean, the creature emerged. It was almost beautiful in a monstrous way, all lean power and unnatural grace. But it was those eyes, burning yellow orbs that promised a kind of hunger I couldn't comprehend, that pushed me over the edge. I threw open the tower door. This thing wanted me to cower in fear, to play its twisted game. I wasn't having it. Rifle in hand, I descended the ladder, heart pounding a battle cry I barely recognized as my own. The hikers giggled like excited children. The creature tilted its head, seemingly curious. You want a piece of me? Come and get it. I roared, leveling the rifle at the beast. It snarled, a noise like nails on a chalkboard, and tensed its spindly body as if to pounce. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a flicker of movement. The hikers, faces now contorted in rage, were sprinting towards me, brandishing wicked-looking knives. Panic spiked through me. Too many attackers impossible to fend them all off at once. The creature watched, a spectator at a deadly game. 
the first hiker reached me, a blur of motion. I swung the rifle but heard a satisfying crack as bone gave way. He crumpled, but his partner was right behind him. I ducked the swipe of a knife, feeling the cold blade graze my scalp. The hikers lunged again, their movements frenzied. I fired a shot into the air, hoping the noise would startle them, buy me some time. The creature flinched, and for a fleeting second, I saw something like fear flicker in its eyes. But the humans were relentless. One caught my legs, knocking me off balance. I tumbled to the ground, the rifle flying from my grasp. I kicked out wildly, catching the man in the stomach and sending him sprawling. Scrambled to my feet, eyes desperately searching for my rifle. That's when I saw it, inches from the creature's feet. It stood stock still, as if deciding between fight or flight. In a reckless gamble, I lunged forward, snatching up the rifle. The hikers were closing in again, their faces masks of bloodlust. The creature hissed, bearing rows of terrifying teeth. The moment seemed to stretch into eternity. The hikers, the creature, myself, all frozen in a tableau of primal struggle. The creature's gaze darted between me, its eyes burning with cold calculation, and the approaching humans, its body tense with indecision. Then, it moved. Not towards me, but towards the hikers. A flash of claws, a blur of inhuman speed, and the woman shrieked, a spray of crimson arcing through the air. She crumpled, one arm a mangled ruin. Her partner froze, eyes wide with a terror that mirrored my own. The creature snarled, its focus solely on the remaining hiker. He turned and ran, a futile gesture against its predatory speed. With a lunge, it brought him down, its weight shattering his spine. The screams echoed horribly through the clearing, then cut off with a sickening gurgle. I stood, rifle dangling from numb fingers, as the creature stalked back toward me. It held something in its claws, the woman's severed arm. With sickening methodicalness, it began to tear into the flesh, ignoring my presence entirely. I fumbled for my radio. There was a chance, a slim one, that the sudden violence might have disrupted the static enough to send out a distress call. The creature watched me, chewing noisily, its eyes seeming to gleam with a gruesome amusement. The radio crackled to life. Cade? You there? Something's happening, interference, what the hell? It was my supervisor's voice, laced with panic. They're here, there, I stumbled over the words, my voice strangled. Then I described the creature, the gruesome feeding, as calmly as I could. A long silence stretched over the airwaves, then my supervisor's voice, choked with horror and disbelief. Don't move. We're sending everyone, just hold on. There was a burst of static, then nothing but the chilling sound of the creature tearing at its grisly meal. By the time the rescue team arrived, it was gone. They found the bodies of the hikers, horribly mutilated, and me, spattered in blood that wasn't mine, still clutching the useless radio. The official report was a jumble of euphemisms and deliberate omissions. Animal attack, victim of extreme trauma, unidentified wildlife. My eyewitness account was dismissed, chalked up to shock. They sent me to therapists, offered medication. They wanted to bury the truth, to file away the horrific events under a comforting, explainable label. But I know what I saw, what lurks out there in the shadows of the ancient forests. It wasn't the first time the creature, or those like it, 
had haunted. And it wouldn't be the last. I left the service. Couldn't face the towers, the trees, the oppressive silence that now held the promise of unseen eyes and rasping, hungry breaths. Cities feel safer now, despite the crowds. Safer, but not safe. I sleep with a gun under my pillow, barricading myself in every night. The dreams haven't stopped, nor has the feeling of being watched. The wilderness changed me. They said the isolation was the dangerous part of the job. They were wrong. What's truly dangerous is what the isolation reveals, the monstrous things that share this world with us, hiding in plain sight. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear the scratching at my window, the low rasp that promises violence and a ravenous, unnatural hunger. I tell myself it's the wind, or maybe the settling walls of my apartment building. But deep down, I know. The cities, with their noise and lights, are just another kind of wilderness, a different hunting ground. And some predators, monstrous as they may be, can adapt. The creature that stalked me in the California redwoods, it might be out there, closer than I think. And it won't forget the taste of fear. My name is Ben Tanner, and this happened to me in the late summer of 2004. Back then, I was green as pine needles in my first season as a lookout in the rugged Siskiyou Mountains of Northern California. They don't tell you about the isolation in the training manual. That kind of quiet can either settle in your bones or drive you a little mad. My wife worried about that, but hey, the pay was decent and the views couldn't be beat. At least, that's what I told myself at first. See, the Siskiyas have history. Old tales the locals spin, prospectors vanished in the gold rush days, whispers about Bigfoot sightings. Mostly, I laughed it off. Then the birds went silent. Not just a few flew off or a change in migration patterns. It was like a switch flipped, the whole forest falling quiet except for the rustle of leaves and the creak of branches. Put me on edge, that unnatural silence, though I tried to reason it away. Then came the carcass. I found it a short hike from my tower, down near a stream, a young buck, not taken down by a cougar or bear. This thing was practically shredded. There were massive puncture wounds, bones cracked open. And the smell, it stuck in the back of my throat, something rank and rotten, not like any natural decay. Radioed it down to the ranger station, and they sent Flynn, across the old veteran, out to check it out. Flynn took one look at the carcass, his face pale under his weathered skin. He muttered something about poachers getting bolder, but we both knew that wasn't right. Whatever got that deer was massive, and powerful enough to break bones like twigs. The rest of the week was tense. Flynn left, promising to send someone else but no one came. I hiked every day, rifle strapped to my back, scanning the dense tree line, the feeling of being watched growing heavier. Nights were the worst. My small cabin suddenly felt too exposed. One particularly foggy night, I heard it, scratching around the base of my tower. Slow, methodical. I peered over the railing, heart pounding. But the fog was too thick to see anything but swirling gray shapes. Still, the scratching went on for hours, stopping abruptly as the first rays of dawn broke through. I tried radioing for backup. Nothing but static in response. It was like I was all alone out there. 
When I wasn't on patrol, I started barricading myself inside, checking the locks obsessively. Sleep was a luxury I couldn't afford. After about a week of this, I found the note. Crudely scrawled on a scrap of paper, it was tied to a rock on my doorstep. Just two words, we see. I felt the chill in my gut before I even understood the implication. I hadn't just imagined those eyes in the trees. I was being hunted. Then, the disappearances started. Two hikers on the lower trails, their campsite was found in disarray, bloodstains, but no bodies. Flynn finally came out, two other rangers in tow. I told them everything, every chilling detail, even knowing they'd think I was cracked. Flynn had that look on his face, the one that says he might believe you, but it's easier not to. Scouring the woods didn't turn up a damn thing. No trace of the hikers, no sign of what I swore was stalking me. They were ready to call it. A freak bear attack, they said, hikers getting disoriented, losing their way. But I knew. And deep down, I think Flynn did too, even as he sent those other rangers back and told me to go on as usual. The next day, a thick fog rolled in, just as heavy as that night I heard the scratching. I packed a few essentials. I wasn't sticking around. I left my post, radioed in a half-assed excuse about a family emergency. Whatever. They could deal with the fallout. I headed to the ranger station, footsteps quick on the trail. I could feel those eyes boring into my back, waiting for me to slip up. Just as the station building came into view, breaking through the mist, I heard it, a throaty growl from the trees behind me. I turned in time to see a flash of movement, a hulking form with eyes that burned like embers in the fog. It was lean and skeletal, far too long limbed to be any creature I knew. Its mouth was a stretched, gaping maw filled with jagged teeth. Terror jolted through me. I broke into a run, fumbling for the rifle. The station was so close, but in the grip of fear, it felt impossibly distant. The sprint to the ranger station was a blur. My lungs burned, my panicked breaths ragged gasps in the heavy, fog-laden air. Behind me, I heard the thudding of something impossibly fast on the trail, the snap of branches. It was gaining on me. I slammed through the station door, fumbling with the deadbolt. Flynn and another ranger, a woman named Harper I barely recognized, were inside, startled by my sudden entrance. Tanner? What the hell, Flynn began. It's out there. I gasped, the words tumbling out, it's real, it's... A guttural roar caught me off. The station windows rattled as something massive slammed into the side of the building. We scrambled back, reaching for our weapons as splinters flew from the cracked wood paneling. The creature circled the building, its rasping breath and guttural snarls echoing with terrifying clarity. Flynn, his initial shock replaced with a grim determination, took charge. Barricade the windows. Call for backup, now, he barked at Harper. She rushed to the radio, but the line was dead, filled with the same static that had haunted me for weeks. We were on our own. The creature slammed into the door repeatedly, the heavy wood groaning in protest. Time seemed to crawl by, each echoing thought another tick closer to it breaching our makeshift defenses. We gotta fight back. I grabbed my rifle. Even through the fog-shrouded windows, I could see the creature's shadowy form shifting back and forth. Flynn nodded, eyes narrowed. On my signal, 
we fire through the windows. Aim for the head. We waited, the silence broken only by the creature's relentless assault. Suddenly, it slammed into the side of the building with a force that sent a tremor through the floor. A ragged hole splintered the wall. Now! Flynn shouted. We fired in unison. The gunshots echoed deafeningly in the small space. Outside, the creature emitted a piercing howl that faded into a series of pain snarls. It thrashed against the building once more, then there was silence. Cautiously, we approached the shattered window. The fog was starting to thin, and in the pale light, I could just make out the gruesome aftermath. Blood spattered the ground, streaks of crimson against the muddy earth. There was no sign of the creature itself. It had either fled, or, my mind refused to finish the thought. Relief washed over me, weak and fleeting. But Flynn's face remained grim. It's hurt, he said simply, but not gone. The backup arrived hours later, a heavily armed team, their faces set with the same mixture of dread and determination I'd seen in Flynn's eyes. They didn't find the creature, but they found the evidence, massive, clawed tracks that led deep into the woods, bloodstains on trees, remnants of shredded clothing belonging to the vanished hikers. Finally, they believed. The official explanation was a rogue bear, mutated or diseased, driven to unusual levels of aggression. They put out warnings, organized hunting parties. I never went back to the Siskius. The money didn't matter after what I saw. My wife held me tight that first night home and didn't ask too many questions. Some things are better left buried alongside the deep secrets of the woods. But even now, in a quiet apartment miles from those shadowed peaks, I still check the windows each night. Sometimes, when a dense fog rolls in, I swear I hear a scratching sound at my door. And in the back of my mind, I know, deep down, that the creature from the Siskius might never be truly gone. It carries a part of me in its gaping jaws, a piece of my sanity lost in the heart of that ancient, unforgiving wilderness. My name's Wyatt Jensen, and this happened to me back in 2008 in the wild heart of Alaska. Never cared for cities, give me snow, solitude, and a fire tower to watch over. Figured it was the safest kind of wilderness job a man could want. How wrong I was. Started out ordinary enough. Weeks spent spotting wildfires, logging weather patterns, listening to the crackle of the radio and the sigh of wind through the spruce trees. Then came the blizzard, an early one for the season, dumping mountains of snow in a matter of days. Radio went dead, power lines snapped, and I was cut off like you wouldn't believe. Should have been worried, but back then I was young, a little too cocky. Figured I'd bunker down, ride it out. I had supplies, I had skills, and I had a rifle. First night of the storm, that's when I saw the tracks. Big not like any bear I'd ever seen in these parts. Pacing back and forth below my tower, circling in the deepening snow. Didn't sleep much, kept imagining claws scratching at the support beams, trying to get in. The tracks were gone in the morning, drifted over by relentless snowfall. Told myself it was just some oversized wolverine, blown off course by the storm. But all that day, I felt eyes on me. An uneasy prickling at the back of my neck, and that same gnawing certainty I'd had growing up on the edge of the woods, that there are some things man was never meant to see. 
things got steadily worse once the storm broke. The radio stayed stubbornly silent, a frustrating, unnerving quiet. Then came the carcass. A moose, not far from the base of my tower. Not killed by any predator I could recognize, torn apart with horrifying strength, half of it missing. I tried not to think about what might be getting strong enough out there to do something like that. Then one night, there it was. Leaning against the base of my tower, a gaunt silhouette framed by the eerie glow of the aurora borealis. Too tall for a man, too skinny for a bear. Hairless, stretched skin, a skeletal form limbed by moonlight and shifting aurora hues. But those eyes, they glowed yellow in the darkness, filled with an intelligence that pierced me through. I fired a shot over its head, hoping to scare it off. It snarled, a rasping, chilling sound that echoed off the ice-laden trees, then retreated back into the night. But it was clear now. I was cornered. This wasn't about survival anymore. It was about buying time, about hoping rescue arrived before the creature decided it was done playing this twisted game. I was prey, and my tower the most inconvenient of traps. Days turned into nights, punctuated by the scratching at the door, the low growls from the floorboards. That awful rasping breath, coming ever closer. I barricaded the tower's single entry point stacking everything I could against it. It wouldn't hold, not against the kind of force that hunted me. The night it finally made its real move, I was ready. Rifle loaded, and gasoline jerrycans strategically placed. One well-placed shot, and I could turn my tower into an inferno, maybe take that unholy thing with me if I got cornered. I'd always figured death by fire had to be better than whatever end it had planned for me. It started with the stairs. Wood groaned and splintered from below, and then a screech of metal as the ladder rungs bent under impossible weight. The creature was climbing. And it was heavy. On the radio, something flickered, a crackling burst of static followed by a faint voice. The rescue team. I stumbled to the radio set, hope surging through me. My fingers fumbled as I tried to respond, to tell them I was here, I was alive. Then the barricade broke. A single clawed hand pierced through the wooden slats, widening the gap with horrifying ease. My mouth worked but no sound emerged. The barricade fell apart and the creature hauled itself into the room. It was even more grotesque up close, those impossibly long limbs, the gaping moth filled with rows of needle-like teeth. Its stench filled the room, a foul mix of wet fur and something rank and rotten. It lunged, and I... I fired. The gunshot boomed in the enclosed space, deafening me for a moment. Yellow eyes flared in rage, and the creature twisted in midair, a searing hiss escaping its maw. It landed awkwardly, fury burning behind its feral eyes. But I was already moving. I leapt for the gasoline. The creature sprang after me, but I was faster, fueled by a desperate, frantic kind of courage. I grabbed the first jerrycan ripping off the cap and splashing the pungent liquid across the floorboards. Behind me, the creature snarled, its focus shifting for one precious second. I struck the match. Flinging it back, I watched as the gasoline ignited in a roar of flame. The creature screeched, consumed by fire. It thrashed wildly, setting the old wooden structure ablaze. Clutching the radio, I sprinted for the safety hatch on the tower's roof. Pain exploded in my leg, it must have caught me as I swung through, 
leaving a burning trail of gas in my wake. Coughing against the acrid smoke, I hauled myself up onto the metal roof, the ladder below me already disappearing in the flames. Heart pounding against my ribs, I fumbled for the radio. Eat, static, coordinates, anyone. It was them, close, but the signal kept breaking up. I shouted my location, my desperate pleas barely audible over the roar of the fire and the creature's agonized screeches. Suddenly, the tower groaned. Supports weakened by the inferno began buckling. The creature, still burning, was focused only on escape. With an inhuman surge of strength, it ripped open a vent on the opposite side, squeezing through the mangled metal. I watched in horror as it clawed its way across the roof towards me. A tongue of flame flicked at its shoulder, but it continued, single-minded and driven. Then, with a sickening crack, the metal beneath it twisted. The roof gave way. Flames swallowed the creature and a final, inhuman wail echoed up at me before it vanished back into the belly of the inferno. Smoke billowed, thick and black, obscuring everything below. Wyatt. Respond. I could hear the panic in the rescue pilot's voice now, edging closer through the static. I scrambled across the remaining roof kicking open the emergency access panel. Cold air rushed up, clearing my head. Below, the fire raged, consuming the tower and everything in it. I closed my eyes for one long moment, tasting ash mixed with adrenaline, and then lowered myself down into the waiting helicopter. They never found the body. No trace of the creature amongst the ashes of my tower. Some claimed the fire cooked it into nothingness, others that it found another way out, escaped. My report, garbled, half-crazed rants about monsters and burning eyes, was buried and explained away with words like shock and trauma. Now, every time I glance at my scarred leg, I remember the heat of those claws, the stink of burning fur and I wonder if the rescue team truly found me in time, or if something else clung to the struts of that helicopter, slinking back into the uncharted vastness of the Alaskan wilderness under cover of night. I don't work fire towers anymore. Took up a nice, quiet desk job, for walls around me and a security system that makes me feel a little less exposed. But I still dream of that blazing tower, of the creature tearing through the flames, its eyes fixed on me with a chilling hunger. And some nights, when the fire crackles in the hearth and the wind howls like a lonely wolf, I swear I feel a flicker of heat on my scarred skin, and smell a faint whiff of rot and singed fur. It's then I realize, they label them unsolved disappearances and gruesome wilderness fatalities for a reason. That out there, in the uncaring places where nature reigns supreme, there are things that defy explanation. Things that hide in the shadows, waiting for the next lost soul to wander into their hunting grounds. And even with all the concrete and steel of the city, I'll never truly feel safe again. My name's Wyatt Jensen and this happened to me in the summer of 2012, up in Idaho's remote Selkirk Mountains. A quiet guy like me, the fire lookout job seemed perfect. Pay was decent, views were incredible, and the solitude, most days, I relished it. Then came the night the radio went haywire. See, I'd heard the old-timer tales. Bigfoot sightings weird lights in the mountains, things folks brush aside with bad reception or too much moonshine. Never thought I'd be the one proving them right. It started in late July, the air thick with that pre-fire season tension. I picked up a transmission, 
bursts of static broken by a garbled, shrieking voice. Just when I thought it was a faulty signal, I'd hear a sound I couldn't explain, like heavy breathing, just below the crackle of the radio. Sent shivers down my spine, it did. Nights were the worst. Up in my tower, I was a sitting duck. Started seeing movement down below, flickering shadows way too tall to be deer or bear. Once, I saw a pair of eyes reflecting the moonlight, blazing yellow like a cornered cat. Radio was no help. Those nights, I kept my rifle loaded, hardly slept a wink. Then came the carcass. Not my first animal kill, but this, this was on another level. Half-eaten, like something had just gotten interrupted while feasting. Its neck looked snapped clean in two. That was enough for me. Called it in, told them about the radio, the eyes, the whole nine yards. They sent Eli, grizzled old ranger, to check it out. Eli had that skeptical look, but it faded as he crouched over the carcass. No bear tracks, no sign of other predators. Damn strange, he muttered, but it ain't proof of your ghost in the woods. When they found what was left of those hikers a week later, Eli's tone changed. A young couple disappeared from the lower campgrounds. Their tent was torn to shreds, sleeping bags spattered with blood. Search turned up nothing but a ripped-up backpack and some chillingly large footprints. The look in Eli's eyes. I knew he was starting to believe me. Radio chatter exploded with whispers and fear. They sent up reinforcements, a team of guys in camel gear, serious weaponry strapped to their backs. Suddenly, my tower was mission control, and I was the one with the first-hand knowledge. We laid low for a few nights, the armed crew patrolling while I kept watch. I hated to admit it, but their presence eased the gnawing dread in my gut. Then, one evening, a full moon hung heavy in the sky, casting long shadows across the wilderness. That's when we spotted it. Crouched on a ridge, maybe a hundred yards from the tower, was a hulking shape. Even at a distance, it was bigger than any man, tall and wiry with limbs that seemed, wrong, somehow. Its head twisted on a too long neck to stare straight at my tower, yellow eyes shining in the darkness. I scrambled for the radio, my hands shaking. We got eyes on it. I shouted, my voice ragged. It's here! The team below erupted into motion, their flashlights bobbing through the trees as they rushed towards the ridge. I heard them let out a startled yell as the creature vanished. But in the eerie quiet that followed, a low growl started up under my tower. I pressed myself against the glass, frantically scanning the base of the tower. For a heart-stopping moment, I saw them again, those yellow eyes boring into mine from the shadows. A gunshot echoed below, then another. Frantic yells, more flashes of light, then silence. My radio crackled urgently, a breathless voice calling in. We need backup. Requesting immediate, oh God, it got Thompson. The transmission cut off, replaced by a shriek that chilled me to the bone. It wasn't quite human, but there was a terrible pain in it. I grabbed my rifle, mind racing. More gunshots echoed through the trees, and then, a heavy crash, like a tree toppling to the ground. Silence followed, a horrifying, ringing silence broken only by my own ragged breaths. The minutes that followed were the longest of my life. I gripped the rifle, waiting for the inevitable assault. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a branch, had me jumping. 
But the creature didn't come for me. Instead, I heard the sounds of something moving back into the trees, heavy footfalls that faded into the surrounding darkness. First light brought the horrifying aftermath. Below the tower was carnage. A sickening pool of blood stained the ground, drag marks disappearing into the tangled undergrowth. Of Thompson, there was only his mangled radio and a piece of torn uniform snagged on a broken branch. The rest of the team, pale and shaken, stumbled out of the trees just as the main backup squad arrived. They found more traces near the ridge, a swath of trampled brush, splatters of blood that wasn't human. Whatever was out there, it was big, powerful, and ruthless. Official report called it a freak bear attack, a cover-up to stop hikers from panicking. But everyone who was there knew the truth. Days blurred together. More searches, more dead ends. They brought in thermal scopes, tracking dogs, even a chopper buzzing low over the peaks. Nothing. The creature vanished without a trace. I finished out my shift like a ghost, seeing its eyes in every shadow and hearing its guttural snarl in every rustle of wind. When they offered me another posting, I laughed in their faces. Packed my gear that night, left before dawn, and never looked back. People call me crazy when I tell them what happened. Some figure I snapped under the pressure. Hell, maybe they're right. Maybe I concocted the whole damn thing out of fear and loneliness. Either way, it broke me, tore a piece of my soul loose up there on that mountain. I don't live in remote places anymore. Crowded city streets are my territory now. Yet, at night, when the shadows stretch long and the city noises fade, I check the window locks twice. Sometimes I think I see a flicker of movement in the alley, a flash of yellow in the dim glow of a street light. Once, I could swear I heard a scratch at the fire escape. Then I remember, it couldn't possibly be up here, so far from the wild places it calls home. Or maybe, deep down, the worst fear is that it doesn't remember me. That while I carry the scars, those chilling yellow eyes have long moved on, their hunger sated by another poor soul who wandered too far from the well-trod trails. The Selkirks are vast, filled with hushed secrets that echo in the wind. Some things are better left undisturbed, lost in the ancient dance of predator and prey that existed long before humans dared put lookout towers on those lonely peaks. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me back in the fall of 92. I worked as a fire lookout in the remote peaks of the Gila National Forest, New Mexico. Rugged country, with canyons deep enough to swallow a yell and forests so thick they could hide anything. Love the solitude, the feeling of being far from the hustle of cities and people. Sometimes, it felt like I had the whole wild world to myself. I'm not a superstitious man, but that fall brought a shift. The wind carried an odd tang in the air, the animals seemed restless, even the sunsets looked, wrong, somehow. A gut feeling, you know, the kind that says something's off kilter. I shrugged it off at first, chalked it up to spending too many weeks alone. My fire lookout tower was a rickety old thing, a wooden platform teetering on the edge of a cliff. Offered a 360 view of the wilderness, which was the whole point after all. From up there, I felt like an eagle, but let me tell you, the nights brought a whole different feeling. Being alone at that height, with only the flimsy walls and a propane lamp between me and the darkness, Let's just say I kept a loaded rifle close by. 
One evening in late September, the wind whipped up, rattling the tower supports like a kid shaking a tin can. Through the swirling leaves, I saw a figure moving down the mountainside. At first, I figured it was some lost hiker caught out too late, a sight I'd seen before. I grabbed a flashlight and radioed down to HQ. HQ, come in, I think I got a situation here. Possible lost hiker inbound. No response. Static crackled over the speakers. HQ, do you copy? Over, I repeated. Still nothing. I squinted at the figure. The closer it got, the less human it looked. It moved wrong, jerky and uncoordinated, limbs too long in proportion to its body. My grip on the flashlight tightened. Then it stumbled into a clearing bathed in moonlight, and I got my first good look. It was tall all right, thin as a starved dog, with pale, hairless skin that seemed stretched too tight over the bones. Its eyes were wide and black, reflecting the moonlight like a cat's. Its mouth, I still try to forget the mouth. Too wide, too full of sharp, ragged teeth. It wasn't human. Whatever it was, it wasn't natural. I had two choices, run or hide. The tower was too exposed. I might get a shot off but that thing looked fast, and if I missed, I made a break for the woods. I was an ex-marine, in good shape, but whatever that creature was, it moved like a shadow in the night. It let out a piercing, chittering sound that made my skin crawl. I found a deep ravine a few hundred yards from the tower and hunkered down, holding my rifle tight, scanning the tree line. For a long while, all I heard was my breath rasping in my ears and the relentless thrum of my heartbeat. Then I heard a snap of breaking branches somewhere to my left. My hand tightened on the rifle. I aimed in the shadow and tried to steady my trembling hands. Closer now, the rustling and cracking undergrowth, it was coming. Suddenly, something leaped out of the darkness and landed heavily on the ravine edge just a few feet above me. It was the creature, its black eyes glittering, its mouth open and dripping with stringy saliva. It crouched right there, its long, bony fingers twitching, its head cocking as it studied me. For a terrifying moment we stayed that way, frozen. I knew then it was hunting me. Not for food, it was something else, something deeper and more twisted in its intent. The way it stared, it saw me as prey, as sport. Fear turned into a bitter rage. I wasn't going down without a fight. I aimed, my breath held, my fingers squeezing the trigger. But before I could fire, the creature launched itself. With impossible speed and agility, it scrambled up the side of the ravine, landing soundlessly only a couple of feet away. I fired wildly, again and again, the rifle bucking in my hands. It let out a howl, but I couldn't tell if any of the shots found their mark. Pain and fury fueled its lunge at me. The creature landed on my chest knocking the rifle away. I felt sharp nails rake my arms and a hot stench of rot filled my nostrils. We wrestled across the dirt, a blur of snapping teeth and flailing limbs. Its strength was inhuman, its every movement filled with a desperate, feral hunger. In the struggle, I lost my grip. Then, the creature made a mistake. It let out a triumphant hiss, its mouth opening wide and lunging for my throat. That's when I jammed my arm across its jaws. The teeth sank into my flesh, searing pain lancing up my bicep. But with my other hand, 
I fumbled for the discarded rifle. I felt around blindly, found the cold metal, and swung it like a club. The stock slammed into the creature's head with a sickening crack. It howled, releasing my arm, and stumbled backward. I scrambled to my feet, my heart a frantic drumbeat in my chest. It shook its head, disoriented. Blood was leaking from its cracked skull. I raised the rifle again, aiming for a clean shot to end this. Just then, I heard voices and the crackle of the radio. Rowan, report. Rowan. It was HQ, finally coming through. What the hell is going on? Respond. I caught sight of flashlights moving through the woods, the search and rescue team. For one desperate moment I wished they were further away. But then, relief washed over me. I wasn't alone anymore. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me back in the summer of 04. I was a fire lookout up in the Olympic National Forest, Washington. Always loved trees, loved the mountains. Seemed like the ideal spot to spend a few months, get paid to enjoy nature, right? Truth be told, the job wasn't all bird songs and epic sunsets. Sure, the view from the tower was unbeatable, but there were a lot of long, quiet hours, only broken up by radio calls with the rangers at HQ. I had my books, my guitar, my stash of less than gourmet snacks, but cabin fever can settle in quick. Still, it beat the cubicle life I left behind. Sometimes, a guy just needs a change of scenery. One morning, I was sitting on the small balcony outside my tower, soaking in the first rays of sun. It was still early, and the forest below was shrouded in a thick, silvery mist. The air felt damp, the silence broken only by the occasional chirp of a bird waking up. Then, I heard something else. A faint rustling. Figured it was a deer or a squirrel, critters aplenty around here. But after a minute, the rustling grew louder, like something was heading toward the base of the tower. I peered over the railing, scanning the tree line, but saw nothing. Then, a shape emerged from the mist. At first, I couldn't make it out properly. It was human-like but hunched over, walking on all fours, and seemed too large to be a person. Then it was gone, disappearing into the dense underbrush. I blinked hard, thinking the early morning light must be playing tricks on me. Must be some kind of animal. Over the next few days, I caught more glimpses of the figure. It was always at the edges of my vision, always moving with a jittery kind of energy. It began to unsettle me, the way it seemed to be watching me, waiting for something. One afternoon, I was doing a perimeter check and swore I saw movement from behind a tree. When I investigated, there was nothing there. That night, though, I swore I heard footsteps around the tower. A couple of times, I mentioned it during my check-ins with HQ. I figured maybe a bear had wandered into the area, but they just brushed it off. You get cabin fever up there, deck, start seeing things. Problem was, I knew what I saw. And what I saw wasn't an animal. One Friday afternoon, I was getting ready to sign off for the day. Then over the radio came an urgent call from HQ. Declan, we've got reports of a missing hiker on the Redwood Creek Trail, southeast of your position. Any chance you saw something? A jolt went through me. The description of the missing hiker, young guy, solo traveler, fit what little I had glimpsed of the figure. 
the timing, the location, it couldn't be a coincidence. Ah, uh, yeah, dispatch. Actually, I think I might have. But before I could finish, a blood-curdling scream cut through the radio. It echoed over the trees, inhuman, filled with terror. Declan. What the hell was that? There were shouts in the background, a commotion. Then something slammed into the transmission, a blast of distorted static. The signal died. I stood frozen, clutching the radio. Something was seriously wrong down there. I didn't hesitate. I snagged my rifle and emergency pack. There was no way I was staying another minute in that tower, not while people were hurt. Heading towards the source of the scream, I burst through the tree line. What I saw will haunt me forever. The young hiker lay sprawled on the ground in a clearing. His throat had been torn open, his body a horrifying spectacle of blood and viscera. But worst of all was the creature crouched over him, feasting on his remains. It was the same figure I had glimpsed, tall and lanky, with skin like old tree bark. Its face was inhuman, contorted into a mask of hunger and rage. Claws, not hands, tore at the lifeless flesh. Its eyes snapped up, locking onto me. I froze. For a moment, time seemed to stutter to a halt, the only sound my own ragged breathing and the wet tearing of meat. Then the creature let out a piercing shriek, like nails on a chalkboard, and charged. I don't remember much beyond the blur of raw instinct. Raising my rifle, firing off rounds in a blind panic. One of the shots must have hit it because it screeched again, recoiling, one of its elongated limbs leaking black blood. For a moment, I thought I had it cornered. I was almost out of ammo. Then it lunged again, this time knocking the rifle from my hands. The force bowled me over and suddenly I was on the ground, staring up into its dripping maw. Pain erupted as its claws raked across my chest, tearing through fabric, skin, and muscle. I screamed, thrashing blindly. Just as I thought it would be the end, another gunshot rang out. The creature shrieked again, twisting its head in the direction of the shot. Through the haze of pain and fear, I saw figures breaking through the trees, a search and rescue team. Panic must have finally spurred HQ into action. Scrambling backwards, the beast retreated, its burning eyes fixed on the armed rescuers as it melted back into the forest. I lost consciousness soon after. I woke up in a hospital with a nasty scar across my chest and a newfound respect for the dangers lurking in the wilderness. The official story was a bear attack. Nobody believed me about what I truly saw out there. Truth is, part of me doesn't blame them. My name is Declan Murphy and this happened to me in the fall of 1990. Life out in the Olympic National Forest of Washington State is a different beast. Thick, ancient trees, the kind of dampness that seeps into your bones. It's beautiful, but a certain kind of beautiful. Lonely, a touch haunted. Still, it was home. I had a job in a logging town further down the mountain and my little fire lookout cabin nestled way out at the edge of civilization. My routine was set, and I liked it that way. Fall was closing in, bringing that first crisp chill to the air. The tourists who flocked here for the summer hikes were all but gone. That left the locals, the quiet ones who knew how to respect the woods. One of those locals was old Zeke. Grumpy old coot, 
lived off the grid in a shack deeper in the forest. Kept to himself mostly, but we had a sore of friendship. Every couple weeks, I'd leave some supplies on a rock near his property line, and he'd sometimes leave me a freshly caught trout on the porch in return. One morning, I headed out like normal to clear some brush near the tree line. The fog was unusually thick that day, curling around the trees like smoke. I found what I was looking for, but also something I definitely wasn't. A campsite, or what was left of one. Tent torn to shreds, camping gear scattered like someone had fled in a hurry. There were bloodstains on some of the ripped fabric. A lot of bloodstains. That's when the dread settled in. Those stains were mold. I radioed it in, my voice tight with urgency. They sent a ranger, Harrison, to help search the immediate area. We found more blood, and then, footprints. Barefoot prints, too long and narrow to be from any human I knew. The toes ended in sharp points, like claw marks sinking into the mud. Harrison and I exchanged a look. He was a city kid, fresh transfer. Not used to this kind of thing. Whatever had done this, it wasn't an animal. A bear, even a huge one, leaves a different kind of print. I tried to shove the image I'd seen the year before from my mind, that thing at the base of my tower. We followed the tracks for a while. Then, they stopped abruptly, as if the creature had simply disappeared. Harrison suggested maybe it had been some weird prank or a poacher freaked out by the search. I didn't buy it, but I didn't argue. The higher-ups back at the station wouldn't want to hear anything about monsters in the woods. We swept the rest of the area, but came up empty-handed. That night, I was on edge. My cabin felt too exposed, too vulnerable. I loaded my shotgun and kept it propped by the door. The fog outside had gotten even thicker, swathing everything in an eerie silence. Around midnight, my dog, Bear, started growling at the window, his hackles raised. Bear was a big German shepherd, not one to get spooked easily. I crept to the window and peered into the gloom. My heart slammed into my ribs. There, just inside the ring of light cast by the porch bulb, were two glowing yellow eyes staring directly at the cabin. Beside them, I made out a hunched shape, just barely visible in the fog. It was massive. I snatched up the shotgun and fired, the blast shattering the night. The shape let loose a hiss, not an animal sound, but filled with malice. It lunged back into the darkness. The next few days were a blur. More rangers came out, another search, but again, nothing. They found the campsite and some other strange tracks, but that was it. Officially, it was still considered a possible animal attack, though off the record, even Harrison had started looking pale and shaken. The news reported a missing hiker, probably the owner of the wrecked campsite, but his body was never recovered. Zeke never came by for the supplies I had left him. A cold dread settled over me that maybe he hadn't gone missing, maybe something happened deeper in his neck of the woods. I went to check his shack, but it was deserted. The only thing off was a strange symbol scratched into his porch, a ragged circle with three lines inside, almost like a crude stick figure. Winter came, harsh and bitter, and with it, more disappearances. Hikers, hunters, even a couple from my logging town vanished on a weekend outing. I began to notice the creature more often, a fleeting shadow at the edge of the tree lean, glowing eyes in the darkness just beyond my firelight. 
I drank more than I should have, trying to numb the fear twisting in my gut. People said I was getting paranoid, seeing things. Maybe they were right. But then there was the night I found that same symbol Zeke had, scrawled in blood on my truck. That was the breaking point. I told the head ranger I was taking extended leave and got the hell out of there. I never went back, never even looked over my shoulder as I drove away. Some secrets are too dark, some things are better left undisturbed. The woods always felt like they held something more than just trees and wildlife. Now, living in a bustling city, with people all around, I still feel that prickle of unease on the back of my neck. I catch glimpses of shadows in alleyways and hear rustles under my apartment window at night. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm not. But some nights, when the fog hangs thick and heavy on the city streets, I swear I see those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. My name is Kieran Davis and this happened to me in September of 2015. I'd been working as a lookout in the rugged Siskiyou Mountains of Northern California for a couple of seasons. It's remote, the kind of quiet that either gets inside your bones or drives you crazy. My wife didn't like me being away for so long. We'd argued over it, but hey, the pay was good and I had a thing for solitude. That fall though, there was something different in the air, an unease I couldn't shake, like the forest itself was holding its breath. The first sign was the birds. Not just fewer, but nothing. That vibrant songbird chorus I was used to every morning. It just vanished. Silence, except for the creak of branches and the rustle of leaves. A week of that and I was starting to spook myself. Radio down to the ranger station. They chuckled, told me I was too used to my own company. That was before the elk carcass. I found it near one of the lower trails I maintained. Not a pretty sight. It was like something had sucked the life out of the poor thing, insides all torn up but no meat eaten. What got me though were the teeth marks, too massive for a cougar, the wrong shape. I'd seen enough bear attacks to know that wasn't it either. I snapped some photos, radioed it in, and got a grumbled, we'll send someone up. A ranger, Gwen, did turn up a few days later. She was tough, skeptical, but I could tell she was unsettled as we surveyed the carcass. Never seen anything like this, she muttered. The rest of that shift was tense. Every nighttime sound at the base of my tower had me scrambling for my rifle. One night, I swore I saw eyes, that same unnerving yellow glint from those elk photos, watching me from the tree line, but they blinked out just as fast. The higher-ups blamed rogue poachers or even a weird fungal infection making animals act strange. Didn't explain the silence though, that pervasive sense of wrongness hanging over everything. I knew they didn't believe me when I kept bringing up those eerie eyes. Then, the first hiker went missing. Kyle, a seasoned local, out for a long weekend trek. A huge search myself included since I knew the trails best. Found his campsite trashed, bloodstains, same unsettlingly large tracks crisscrossing the area. No sign of his body, nothing to conclude with except another disappearance. Gwen looked grimmer than I'd ever seen her. Things spiraled down quickly from there. Two more vanished just like that panic started to seep into the nearby town. Folks talked in whispers about Bigfoot or some other cryptid. Didn't add up for me. Whatever was out there was cunning.
Kyle hadn't been some clueless newbie. One foggy morning, I heard banging on my tower's ladder. At first, I nearly sighed with relief, thinking it was Gwen or maybe another ranger. But when I shouted down, asking who it was, there was only a low growling in reply. Heart pounding, I peered over the railing. That's when I saw it. The creature was lean, almost skeletal, patches of coarse, mangy fur clinging to its emaciated form. The massive limbs ended in long, wicked claws. The head, that's the part my nightmares returned to. A stretched wolf-like muzzle, but filled with needle-sharp teeth. And those eyes, burning in the fog, filled with a terrifying kind of intelligence. I stumbled back, fumbling with the rifle. I fired off a shot, more out of panic than anything. The creature hissed in pain and bolted away, disappearing into the fog bank with unnatural speed. When Gwen and a full team arrived, they found the ladder scored with deep claw marks, blood on the rungs. My story was met with the same mixture of disbelief and worry. Whatever was out there was escalating. They insisted I evacuate. I argued, felt like a coward, but in the end, I couldn't stay. They said they'd put armed guards near the tower, conduct more extensive searches. I left the Siskius in my rearview mirror. Never set foot back there. I got a warehouse job, the hum of machinery a welcome contrast to that deafening silence. My wife seemed relieved but some nights I could still feel the forest watching me. I found myself checking the locks twice, peering into the shadows at the end of the street. The news reports trickled in. More disappearances, more fruitless searches. Part of me felt guilty, like I should be there, fighting back. That was before I saw the article about Gwen. Found near the base of my old lookout tower, and the description matched what had been in the woods that foggy morning. They called it an animal attack, but I knew better. Sometimes, when the city noise dies down, I think I hear the snap of a branch, a low rustle just outside my window. And I wonder what will happen when the creature finally tires of hunting in the woods when it turns those hungry yellow eyes towards the bright city lights. My name is Elijah Walker. This happened to me in the fall of 1997. Back then, I was working my third season as a fire lookout in the remote stretch of the Gila National Forest, New Mexico. The desert has its own kind of beauty, all rough scrub and red rock canyons, but it can feel a little lonely out there. That fall, though, I started feeling like I wasn't as alone as I thought. It started small. A flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye when I swept the horizon. The sound of footsteps on my tower's ladder one night that stopped abruptly when I shone my light down, leaving only silence and empty rungs. A weird prickling sensation at the back of my neck, like something was watching me. Now, I'm not a superstitious man. Figured it was desert heat getting to me, stress, maybe a mountain lion prowling nearby on the hunt. Still, the unease didn't fade. One stifling afternoon, I was chopping firewood when I saw it. Crouched on a ridge, a good distance away, was a figure. I squinted against the glaring sun. It wasn't human, too tall and hunched, its form seeming to shiver and distort in the heat haze. It turned its head slightly. Even at that distance, I could make out its eyes, that same disturbing yellow color I'd seen in the eyes of a bobcat I'd startled once. I froze the axe falling from my suddenly weak grip. 
The creature held its gaze on me for a long moment, then slowly lowered itself and crept behind a boulder, vanishing. That night, the radio crackled to life. It was the garbled, whispering voice I'd heard before on the airwaves. This time, there was a new element, faint screams, barely audible beneath the static. They cut off with a chilling finality, making the hair on my arms stand on end. The next few days were a blur of nervous vigilance. I started sleeping with my shotgun by the bed. Out on patrol, I constantly scanned for movement, feeling more like hunted than hunter. Then came the day I found the campsite. It was off one of the trails, not far from my tower. Smashed tent, supplies scattered, and blood splatters on the rocks. No bodies, nothing except the remnants of whatever violence had taken place. It looked a bit like a wild animal attack, but deeper, more, intentional. I reported it to the ranger station, but the two they sent out to investigate found nothing else. Probably some lost hikers got into a tussle with a bear, grumbled one of the rangers, a grizzled old-timer named Hank. Maybe, I said, but my voice sounded weak even to my own ears. The harassment escalated after that. I'd find neatly arranged rocks outside my tower door in the mornings, a gutted deer carcass just beyond the tree line with its neck snapped in a way no coyote could manage. The whispering on the radio was almost constant, my name woven into the static bursts. Sleep became impossible. I started to unravel. My reports became wild, frantic. Hank gave me that look again, the look that says you've lost your marbles. Then, one sweltering night, it came up the ladder. I heard the rhythmic scrape of claws on metal, the rasp of its breathing getting closer. I barricaded the tower door with my writing desk, the flimsy thing shaking under the creature's onslaught. I loaded the shotgun, hands trembling. Finally, right before dawn, the assault stopped. Silence fell heavier than before. When the sun rose, I cautiously lowered myself down to the ground. The area around my tower was a mess of gouge marks and dark stains. My own boot prints led away into the brush, ending abruptly not too far off. As if I'd simply walked out into the desert and ceased to exist. I stumbled over to where the trail of prints vanished. There, meticulously laid out in the sand, was a single human finger bone. A message. I threw up right there, bile burning my throat. That was it. My breaking point. I didn't even radio in. I just started walking, leaving my supplies, my post, my whole life behind. I kept expecting to see that hunched shape out of the corner of my eye, the flash of those yellow eyes in the scrub. The fear followed me back into civilization, though. Even now, in this bustling city, I still check the shadows over my shoulder, still jerk awake at the slightest creak in the night. They never found out what happened to those hikers those other people who disappeared from those desolate corners of the desert. Sometimes, I wonder if they found out what happened to me. It left me alive, but a part of me never made it out of the Gila wilderness. The desert holds secrets, some darker than the night itself. I learned that firsthand. Sometimes I think I glimpsed that loping, inhuman shape in the periphery of my vision, and a chill runs down my spine as if that desolate wind still carries the whisper of my name. My name is Lucas Tanner, and this happened to me in 2010. I'd been a lookout for five summers in Maine's North Woods, 
up near the Canadian border. Tough, beautiful country. My little cabin perched on a cliffside felt a million miles from anything some days. Solitude, usually, was my thing. That summer though, there was an edge to the air, a prickling sensation down the back of my neck. Started with the ravens. I like ravens, smart birds. But usually, there's a few that stick around the area, squawking and scavenging. This time, the damn birds descended in droves. Hundreds of them, circling my cabin, roosting in trees till the branches sagged. That constant croaking was enough to set my teeth on edge. Then, that night, I woke from a dead sleep to scratching at the base of the tower. Slow, methodical scratching. I grabbed my rifle, heart pounding. I peered down through the dim moonlight, but there was nothing. Just that persistent scratching that seemed to go on for hours. Animal, I told myself. Probably a porcupine or something. But I didn't buy it. Next morning, I made a sweep of the area. No tracks, nothing out of place, except for a flicker of movement way out at the tree line. Just a glimpse, but the shape wasn't right, too tall, too lanky for a bear or moose. That's when the dread settled in my gut. The radio calls started a few days later. Short bursts of static, then a garbled voice. Once, I thought I heard my name, whispered just below the hiss. It only happened late at night, and it set me on edge every time. I started sleeping with the rifle loaded and propped next to my bed. Tried to report it to the ranger station. They blamed a faulty signal repeater, promised to send someone out after the weekend. Then came the carcass. Not far from my tower, near a stream. Half eaten, more like shredded. Wolf attack was my guess, but the wounds were all wrong the way the bones were snapped and twisted. There were marks too, in the damp earth. Like something massive had dragged the carcass. When the ranger, a guy named Flynn, finally showed up, he looked grim. I ain't never seen nothing like that, he muttered. I told him about the scratching, the radio thing, the feeling of being watched. He gave me that pitying look small-town folk give to those they think are losing their marbles. Things went from bad to worse. Every night the scratching, the static bursts on the radio, and the ever-present feeling of those eyes on me. I began finding things around my cabin, smashed bottles, my firewood stacked in weird patterns. Sleep? Forget about it. My nerves were shot, and paranoia was riding me hard. Then one morning, I looked up from my work to see a figure standing stock still among the trees. Tall, inhumanly tall, with long, skeletal limbs. Skin pulled tight over sharp bones, the color of old parchment. And the head, almost dog-like, but with a longer snout and rows of pointed teeth. It stared at me with those piercing, yellow eyes, then tilted its head ever so slightly. Like it was curious about me. My stomach lurched. I fumbled for the rifle, but when I looked back, the thing was gone. Vanished, like a ghost in the morning fog. I radioed Flynn, my voice scratchy. He must have heard the panic because this time he was out there within the hour. We swept the whole damn area until nightfall. Flynn found some weird, three-toed tracks, massive things. No match to anything he recognized. He chalked it up to a bear with a deformity, but I knew what I saw. That night was the worst. More scratching, 
the radio spitting out nonsense. And then the screams, from down in the valley. They echoed long and shrill before going abruptly silent. The ravens took flight all at once, hundreds of them lifting into the night air like a black cloud. By dawn, I'd resolved to leave. I packed my stuff, told the ranger station I was done, that they could send someone else to clean up my mess. I didn't care if they believed me. As I drove out, I caught a flash of movement in the rearview mirror. There, at the edge of the woods, stood the creature, watching me go. For a split second, our eyes locked, and then it turned and disappeared into the depths of the forest. Folks hear my story, they say it was stress, isolation playing tricks. Maybe. But I know what I saw. Some secrets in those deep woods, some things older than the hills themselves. And sometimes, late at night when I hear a rustling outside my window, I think about that unblinking yellow stare and wonder if it remembers me. My name is Ethan Cole, and this happened to me in the summer of 2008. Back then, I was working my fourth season as a fire lookout in Yellowstone National Park. I'd grown up in the area, so the vast wilds of the park felt like my backyard. Maybe I got a bit too comfortable, too cocky. My wife, Sarah, sure thought so. She hated how long I was gone each summer, but what could I do? Those towers don't run themselves, and the solitude suited me just fine. That year though, things felt off. It started with the missing hiker reports. It wasn't unusual to have a few every season, folks who underestimated the terrain or got surprised by bad weather. But these were different. No sign of foul play, no gear found, not even a stray boot. It was like people just vanished into thin air. Then came the carcass. I was making my rounds one morning and stumbled upon an elk carcass. Torn apart brutally, but not like any predator I'd ever seen. The wounds were too big, even for a grizzly, and there were these strange, ragged puncture marks on its neck. I snapped a few photos and sent them to the ranger station. Never got a reply, which wasn't exactly reassuring. A few nights later, I woke up to scratching at the base of my tower. At first, I figured it was a bear, but bears don't usually scratch like that. The noise just went on and on, making my skin crawl. I grabbed my rifle and spotlight and shone it down. That's when I saw it. It was like nothing I'd ever laid eyes on. Tall and spindly, with skin stretched tight over bone. Its arms were impossibly long, ending in thick, sharp claws that scraped against the metal tower. The head, that's what will haunt my nightmares until my dying day. Like a dog skull but elongated and grotesque, the jaw gaping open to reveal rows of wicked-looking teeth. Yellow eyes blazed back at me in the light. It stared at me with a chilling sort of intelligence. For a heart-stopping moment, we held each other's gaze, and then it just dropped down on all fours and bolted off into the darkness of the forest. Shaking so bad I could barely hold my rifle. I radioed for backup. My voice came out scratchy when I described what I'd seen. There was a long silence on the other end. Ethan, I know the isolation can play tricks on you, my supervisor, Frank, finally said. Maybe it was a mountain lion with mange or something. Frank, I know what I saw. I snapped, my voice rising. The rest of the night, I stayed up with my rifle in my lap. Every rustle of leaves, 
Every snap of a branch sounded like the creature coming back. Finally, dawn came, and I heard the welcome rumble of a ranger truck approaching. Two rangers, Natalie and Tom, burst out of the vehicle, looking concerned. Natalie was a tough veteran, the kind nothing seemed to face. Tom was younger, eager to prove himself. I showed them the claw marks on the tower and described the creature in painstaking detail. They exchanged glances, and I could see my story wasn't going over well. Look, we'll take a sweep of the area, but chances are whatever did this is long gone by now, Natalie said, her tone just a touch condescending, as if she was speaking to a spooked child. Tom went into the woods while Natalie and I circled the tower. My eyes scanned the dense tree lean, my heart pounding a steady rhythm of dread. Suddenly, Tom burst back out of the woods, his face white. I found something, he gasped. He led us a short way in. There, in a small clearing, was the half-eaten body of a hiker. His backpack lay torn open nearby, but there was no sign of him other than the bloody mess the creature had left behind. Natalie turned a bit green and swore. Radio this in, she snapped at Tom, her voice shaking slightly. An hour later, a whole team swarmed the area. But, once again, they found nothing, no trace of the creature. Frank insisted I was mistaken about what I saw. They talked about stress, hallucinations, the dangers of spending too much time alone in the wilderness. I wanted to yell. I wanted to tell them I was right, that they were blind fools. But a part of me, a creeping, insidious part, began to doubt myself. The official report came back a few days later. They chalked the hiker's death up to a bear or mountain lion attack and reminded me in stern language about the potential consequences of crying wolf. So, I kept my mouth shut. I finished the season, lying to myself that it was all in my head. My wife was relieved, of course. Come fall, we packed up and moved back to town. I got a construction job tried, desperately, to put it all behind me. My name's Wyatt Thorne, and this happened to me back in 2015. Back then, I was green as spring leaves on my first season as a lookout in Idaho's sprawling sawtooth wilderness. City boy finding his footing in the wild, trying to prove something to the world, or maybe just to myself. Looking back, maybe a little too eager, a little too reckless. Folks always spun yarns about the sawtooths, rugged, untamed mountains, all dense evergreen forests and glacier-carved peaks. Tales of old prospectors who vanished without a trace, strange lights some folks swore were UFOs. I chuckled it off as tall tales meant to scare the rookies. Now, I ain't so sure. It started small. Rustles in the underbrush after nightfall. Flickering shadows at the edge of the firelight that vanished as soon as I turned to look. Easy to dismiss as tricks of the mind, loneliness playing its games. Then came the carcass. Halfway down a supply trail, a young elk, torn open like a ragged package. No clean kill, this. Chunks of flesh were missing, bones cracked with unnatural force. My skin prickled. Nothing around here could have done that, not a bear, not a wolf. Should have turned back. Should have radioed it in, called for backup but some stubborn part of me wanted answers. I tracked the mess back towards the tree line. That's when I saw the eyes. Two orbs reflecting the fading sunlight, 
pale yellow, rimmed with an unnerving red. They were set too high, the body hidden in the encroaching shadows. My heart kicked into overdrive. I fumbled for my rifle, more out of a desperate need for action than any real plan. As if sensing my movement, the creature stepped out from the trees. It was wrong. Tall as a man, maybe taller, but stooped, limbs too long and ending in clawed hands. Its skin was leathery, stretched tight over sinewy muscles, and the head was like a wolf's, only elongated, jaw gaping wide to reveal rows of wickedly sharp teeth. It stared at me, those eyes burning with a feral intelligence that chilled me to the bone. I don't remember raising the rifle or squeezing the trigger. Just the echoing bang of the shot, the creature letting out a hiss of pain, then retreating in a flash of motion. I stood there, frozen, waiting for the onslaught that never came. Slowly, shaking like a leaf, I backtracked to my tower, leaving a trail of boot prints that told the story better than I ever could. That night was pure hell. The radio barely worked up there, the static crackling with what sounded like guttural growls. Every creak of the tower under the relentless wind was the creature circling, preparing to strike. When dawn finally painted the sky, relief washed over me, mingled with a bone-deep weariness that came from confronting something reason could not explain. I called it in as soon as I got a decent signal. They responded how I expected, concerned murmurs, sending a ranger out to humor the new guy. Caden turned up a day later, seasoned woodsman with a healthy dose of skepticism in his eyes. I expected the knowing nods, the pats on the shoulder while they hinted I needed a break from the isolation. What I got instead was a pale face and a terse, let's go see what did this. We followed my tracks from the day before. He found the blood spatters where the creature was hit, but nothing else. Deeper into the woods, the carcass was gone. No drag marks, no trail to follow. Caden looked at me with a new intensity. Whatever's out here, it ain't normal, he said, voice low. We spent the rest of the day scouring the woods, unease clawing at my gut. We found nothing. Report went up the chain, unknown predator, large, potentially dangerous. They sent a hunting party. Big, burly guys armed to the teeth ready to bring down a rogue grizzly gone mad. They came back empty-handed after a week in the backcountry. The look in their leader's eyes told me they hadn't discounted my story as easily as I'd thought. Words spread quietly on the lookout circuit, whispers about a creature in the sawtooths, something that left even the bravest woodsman shaken. Then came the news of a hiker who went missing on the lower trails search and rescue found his campsite mauled, tent shredded, belongings scattered like a grizzly had come calling. Only there weren't no bear tracks, just footprints too wide to be human. I didn't stick around to see how that story ended. Transferred out, got myself a nice desk job with steady hours and the comforting hum of city traffic outside my window. But most nights, when the shadows deepen and the wind whistles a certain way through the buildings, I swear I hear a scratching at the fire escape, and I remember those burning eyes in the dark, 